Hello, this is uh, Matthew here from the Nations of Sanity Project. I'm just sitting down to have a conversation with Tobias, um, who I've been having a kind of conversation with in a few back and forth comments on some of my videos. Um, most recently, a video I'd done, um, which was a recorded conversation I did with David Friedman, where we were kind of discussing and debating anarcho-capitalism and various aspects of it. Um, and um, as I say, me and Tobias had a little back and forth with some comments in the video section. And I invited Tobias to have a, you know, in-person conversation, because I always find that's more efficient way of communicating. Um, and Tobias uh, kindly agreed and um, has taken the time to have this conversation. So thank you, Tobias, for taking the time to speak with me today. Thank you. Um, and right, and um, we might as well get straight into it. So I mean, I think where we kind of spoke before, because obviously my conversation with David Friedman was kind of, I mean, there was a few aspects to it, but it, it started off um, kind of debating the fact that David Friedman's conceptualization of anarcho-capitalism does allow for NAP violations and coercion. Um, his argument is that an anarcho-capitalist society would likely give a libertarian society that is in line with the NAP, but it could theoretically also give us a society that has things like drug laws and even slavery and things like that. Um, my contention is that that kind of contradicts the anarchism part of anarcho-capitalism. Um, and we kind of had a little back and forth and I'll put the link to that conversation to anyone who's watching this in the description and so they've got reference for what we're following on from. Um, and I, I just want to so probably hand it over to Tobias to kind of go from there with his comments and then we'll just kick into the conversation. So, yeah, well, I was just um, commenting, I guess, uh, you know, I, I was wondering, like, what what is the how does the Venn diagram look basically between like anarcho capitalism and voluntarism? That's kind of what I'm trying to get at. If it's um, you know, if it's like two circles that have you know a lot of overlap, but there might be a little bit on each end that might um, you know allow for specific things that the other one doesn't allow for, or if it's like a smaller circle in a much bigger circle, um, which I think is uh, probably the case, and I think our only real disagreement is which of those circles is larger. So my contention would be that um, anarcho-capitalism would be the larger circle. And I think your contention is that voluntarism is the larger circle and that maybe um, anarcho-capitalism is either you know, an overlapping circle or it's a circle within that. So, um, uh, and then, so I had this uh, analogy that um, I think is maybe uh, useful here, which I would call the um, hourglass analogy. Let's just call it that, um, where I'm imagining that different ideologies, um, particularly like anarchistic ideologies in this case, they can be depicted as like lines, right? That go from the present status quo to an eventual utopia. This would be like the y-axis of this um, hourglass. And the reason why it's an hourglass is because um, there's a lot of strategic decisions of, you know, in adapting to today's world that are very different between these ideological uh, notions. And there's a lot of differences, obviously, in their end goal utopias, right? But I believe that the, there's a spot in the middle where we can all be sort of in general agreement that there's a system, um, and I would classify the system as basically anarcho-capitalism or, you know, sometimes, you know, capitalism can be sort of a sticky word. Uh, so 
you know, it has sort of negative connotations with some people. So we might say market anarchism as just like a little bit broader concept or um, just idea. It's basically the same thing that David Friedman talks about, but just without that sort of semantic element there. Um, either way, it doesn't really matter. It's just semantics to me. But um, anyways, I think that sort of thing is uh, really a uniting kind of a system that is a good um, means to various ideologies ends. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Whereas voluntarism does seem to be more specific to me, that it is a specific, um, like more morality, it's a specific, um, you know, legal order that in David Friedman's world and you know the world that I would sort of advocate towards. Um, it's you know the whole point of it is that different legal orders, different moralities, they're put up on the market basically, and in that market, it is up for people to decide. Um, voluntarily, ultimately, what they want to do. And of course, I believe um, also being, you know, somewhat of a voluntarist um, that uh, a NAP legal order would come organically from that, that people would ultimately favor that above other legal orders. But I would agree with sort of David Friedman's point that that is not necessarily the thing that would come out of anarcho-capitalism, just the thing that it lends itself most to. Yeah, I'm. I would mean, just to sort of clarify, you know, what we are talking about when you talk about those circles with anarcho-capitalism being bigger. What specifically are we talking uh -huh. about? You're talking about like kind of appeal, how many people it's going to sort of appeal to, or. Um, how much it encompasses, like what are we talking about with this when we talk about which one's got the bigger circle? Yeah, well, yeah, how much it encompasses, how much it, um, how much different kind of behaviors and different uh, systems and just things that people can do, basically. Um, you know, voluntarism might not allow you to sell yourself into slavery, say, but in um, depending, it does depend on like what the sort of legal order of the time is, but because anarcho-capitalism isn't really tied to a specific legal order, um, one legal order might be that you could sell yourself into slavery. So in that sense, it's a broader concept. Yeah, I mean, I do find the sell yourself into slavery a little bit oxymoronic in regards to the fact that I kind of define slavery as uh, overriding of your self-ownership um, and declaring you as property and not your own property, whereas obviously self-ownership declares you, you know, right over yourself, which would mean you have the right to obviously enter into any kind of contract you want, which would include one that looks a lot like selling yourself into slavery. Um, but I just suppose I wouldn't characterize that as slavery because my personal definition of slavery or how I've always understood slavery to be defined has like the voluntary aspect of it kind of isn't included in the definition, if that makes sense. So for someone like like for someone to sell themselves into slavery, so to speak, in other words, they're you know, basically making a contractual arrangement with somebody where they're basically offering themselves up under those terms that's not slavery in my mind that's just a contractual agreement from a free individual and to make that agreement you need to be a free self-owning individual you know a slave can't sell himself into slavery i mean it, it might be a bit pedantic 
nitpicking on the word, but but mm -hmm. so, but just to get to your point though, regardless of whether we call it slavery or not, what you're talking about could happen in voluntarism as far as I am concerned, just as easily as it could in anarcho-capitalism. The only real difference that I would have with regards to voluntarism and at least anarcho-capitalism in the way that you and David Friedman are conceptualizing it is when it actually is a nap violation. So selling yourself into slavery for want of a better description i wouldn't view that as a nap violation so there's no reason why you couldn't do that in voluntarism because it's voluntary you know you're volunteering yourself into that arrangement you know um so i would i mean one other thing as well i think it's worth pointing out because when we're talking about anarcho-capitalism i feel like there's three definitions of anarcho-capitalism there's the definition that you and david have there's the definition that I have, which is slightly different, and we'll just I'll discuss that in a second. And then there's a third definition that's different from both of us. And basically what it is, is like, and it's to do with the relationship with voluntarism, because I will speak to some people who identify as anarcho-capitalist, who will insist that anarcho-capitalism and voluntarism are just synonyms for the same thing. They will say that anarcho-capitalism is voluntarism. There's no difference between the two. Then there'll be someone like myself who says there is a difference between the two because voluntarism doesn't specify any kind of economic preference. It just specifies the voluntary nature of the society, i.e., you know, uh, the NAP self ownership and all of that. So, for example, you could have a voluntary commune, which wouldn't really qualify as anarcho capitalism, but would still qualify as voluntarism as long as everybody's um, self ownership is respected. And then the third definition of anarcho-capitalism is the one that you and David Friedman uh, are employing, where anarcho-capitalism... So, so my definition is that anarcho-capitalism is a form of voluntarism, so all ANCAPs should be voluntarists, in my view, but not all voluntarists have to be ANCAPs, if that makes sense. Whereas um, anarcho-capitalism, as David Friedman conceptualizes it, and seems to be your conceptualization of it as well, is that anarcho-capitalism doesn't even have to be voluntarism. Um, and while it, you both contend that it will likely lend itself to a voluntary society in regards to where it's likely to push us, it's not definitionally um, voluntarist or, or libertarian or, or however you want to put it. So, uh, I mean, I don't know, have you, have you heard those sort of differing definitions? Have you come across many people that insist that an anarcho-capitalism is the same as voluntarism, for example? Yeah, yeah, um, for sure. Uh, it just it does depend like a lot on if you're just approaching this from like a philosophical angle versus if you're approaching this from like an economic angle i feel like you know anarcho-capitalism is just a system it's a means to various ends it's not the ends within itself you know so in that sense like but it is an end. I mean, I know you're saying about it being the means to an end, but it is, it is also an end. Because one of the things that me and David seemed to get stuck on a little bit was he was kind of challenging me to sort of like saying, well, how are you going to establish this? As if it was any more difficult to establish a voluntary society than it was an anarcho-capitalist society. I mean, like, either way, you need enough willing participants to, to, to make that society. Whether you're saying, well, let's all be anarcho-capitalist, whatever we decide that entails, I don't see how that's any harder sell. In fact, I would argue that it is a harder sell, but I don't see how, how saying let's all be voluntarist is a harder sell to more people than saying let's all be anarcho-capitalist. You know, there's still, there's still a defining quality there. There's still a criteria that you've got to meet. You know, like, I mean, I, as I put it to David, I said like, you know, at the end of the day, if you were living in a communist dictatorship, you wouldn't call that anarcho-capitalism by any stretch of the imagination. So there's obviously certain criteria that anarcho-capitalism has to meet to be defined as anarcho-capitalism. And my point was the way I always defined anarcho-capitalism, and I'm happy to work with other people's definitions, but just you know where I'm coming from, the way I always defined anarcho-capitalism is although anarchism isn't as explicit as voluntarism with regards to the whole self-ownership nap thing, I do think it is implicit because anarchism I mean, me and David got a bit stuck on the definition of government, but for me, it's not about what the definition of government is, it's about what the definition of rulers is, because that's what anarchism actually opposes. Anarchism is about no rulers, as far as I understand, the most kind of generalized definition of anarchism would be no rulers. 
And for me, any organisation, whether it's, I mean, that implies no government, because obviously government would be a form of rulers, but it would also include no kings, no queens. But in my view, it would also include no drug laws, no slavery, because that is still ruling people in the same kind of fundamental way. You might say that a slave owner doesn't qualify as a government for some other reason, but I would argue that they still qualify as a ruler with regards to the fact that they are asserting some kind of right over another person. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I want to go a little bit back to the slavery point mm -hmm. um, where you said that like, even in a voluntarist society, you could still, you know, sign a contract and become, you know, someone's uh, kind of, I think you could become someone's sort of temporary property for a duration of time, perhaps, or something like that. But I think after a certain point in a voluntarist society, as opposed to a different legal order within anarcho capitalism, um, at a certain point, I think that a court might step in. Or like if say, if you have signed yourself to work for someone else, you know, for the rest of your life, and that's the contract that you made, right? I think if you wanted to end that contract, that's something that a voluntarist system, voluntarist legal order would allow you to do. Whereas another, you know, slightly different legal order might not allow you to do it might respect the right of the contract over the right of um you know your choices to defy that contract later on right yeah yeah I, I understand what you're saying i mean i suppose i I mean, I suppose that's why I resist the the framing of selling yourself into slavery. I just I don't feel like it's really slavery because of the the get out clauses you spoke about. And and the fact of the matter is, is like say for example, I say I said right, I'll sell myself to, into slavery to you for a year or whatever. Um, and let's say it's because I owe you a debt. Let's say I owe you some money, and I say look, I'll be a slave for a year. In, and, and, and in exchange for that, you agree to write off this debt so I don't owe it to you anymore. And then let's say halfway through the year, I change my mind. In a voluntary society, and I think this would be the same in a, in a capitalist society, certainly an anarcho-capitalist society, but you feel free to tell me if you think it's different. But in a voluntary society, if you broke contract halfway through, then you are guilty of violating a contract and breaking a contract. And whatever penalties you stipulated in the contract would obviously be applicable. Or if there weren't anything explicitly stipulated with regard, regards to penalty, the absolute minimum, the debt that I, like say so the money I owed you, I would still owe you because I've the, the, the agreement that we made to pay off that debt, I've now gone back on, you know? So, um, so yeah, I mean, I would still have that kind of, I mean, the thing is about the problem with, the problem with thinking of people as property is that we're not really. I mean, again, this might get into kind of pedantic word definitions, but the way I've always conceptualized property and, and beings as not the same thing, you know, like property is objects, people are beings. And when I talk about self-ownership, I don't mean that we are our own property. I just mean that we own ourselves as you know, as, as, as beings, as, as in regards to having right over ourselves. Like a lot of people immediately attach the word property. And the problem with selling yourself into slavery is, is there's no way that I can fully give myself to you because I will always have some control over myself that I just can't give up. Now, I can make an agreement with you that I will act as if I belong to you. You know, I mean, I can make that agreement, but in reality, I can't truly put you in full control of me because whatever I do whatever I agree to I am still an autonomous being I still have control over myself I still have the free will and while I've made an agreement with you to act otherwise and obviously if I violate that agreement then I'm guilty of violating a contract and all the rest of it the fact of the matter is is like truly being your slave is not something I can truly commit to I can only kind of agree to 
to act in that way. I mean, I had a conversation with somebody about the kind of the, what what a slave is in regards to how we define it in the concept of self ownership and and property and stuff like that. Because the person I was speaking to was saying, "Well, look, you know, slaves are deemed as property, and they're deemed as being owned by somebody else." And I'm like, "And like, yeah, they are deemed that way, but that's not legitimate." the moral reality is that every individual owns themselves so what a slave is in that context is a free individual that's treated as if he's owned by somebody else as property but he's still in reality a free individual he's just not treated that way which might sound a bit of a bit it's just about trying to clarify our definitions on things because um that yeah i mean that's basically the point i'm making with the whole selling yourself into slavery thing so so i forgot my point to why i went down that road actually but but yeah but that's the one little point i wanted to make with regards to the whole selling yourself into slavery thing and i and i don't see how it would be i mean you tell me how you think it would be different but i don't see how it would be really any different because if i violate a contract i violate a contract if that's a voluntary society then the violation is there and if it's a capitalist society the violation is basically the same in my view i mean i'm not seeing the difference perhaps you can illuminate well one would be we're talking about like differences in the legal order i think so you know um i think you can fundamentally get out of uh sort of a a specific like contractual agreement just by sort of changing your mind in the future if you're in a voluntarist society you you can't escape maybe that debt but it's um i don't think i don't think it would justify people using sort of aggressive means to go after that debt do, do you think do you think in a voluntarist society if you um if you owe someone some money, is that enough to where you've violated the NAP and then they have the right to sort of go after you? Well, I mean, when it comes to violating the NAP and, and, and you, what your justifiable response is, there's a, there is always a question of proportionality and necessity. So like, uh -huh. the, the idea of the non-aggression principle, you know, I always specify, you know, it's not a pacifist principle. It does allow force, but only force used to protect self-ownership. So the idea is, is anybody who is in violation of self-ownership, you're permitted to use force that's one necessary to either prevent that that um you know if, if you're doing if we see obviously if you're acting beforehand then it's like you know whatever's necessary to for so it's like a little bit like what the standards we have today like for example if like it's self-defense or whatever someone broke into your home and, and you killed them or whatever and it was deemed self-defense because the force you used was necessary whereas if you were able to subdue them and tie them up and then killed them when you didn't need to, I know that's an extreme example, but just to make the, the, the differences obvious, then obviously that wouldn't be deemed as necessary force or justifiable or, or, or what have you. Now, when it comes to violating a contract, for example, if I owed you money, you wouldn't have the right to enslave me because I owed you money. That wouldn't be proportionate response. So even though in this other scenario, I was prepared to offer to be your slave in this kind of weird agreement that, that I was going to conduct, conduct, even in that scenario, even though I was prepared to offer that as payment, that only because that's my choice to, to do that. But it doesn't work the other way in regards to sort of saying, well, because you owe me this money, this level of response is appropriate in other words i can enslave you and if i make an agreement to be your quote-unquote slave for a year or whatever and i and i bail out halfway through and i violate the contract again i am guilty of violating the contract but again the uh, the justifiable or proportional response to that wouldn't be to enslave me or you know like that level of or, of any force above that so um i hope that answers your question yeah, yeah. So I like I think that's maybe the difference then because I think it's um conceivable that in a anarcho-capitalist system you might have well, you might have like actual prisons, you know, that might be a private institution that could exist on the market. Um and you might have uh you know kind of variations of that, which might 
frankly, include plantations. I mean, um, include what? Sorry, might include plantations. You know, what slavery? You mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, it wouldn't be likely because I think people today are more ethical than that. That they wouldn't want to allow that or you know buy the services of anything yeah. you know, made that way. So I don't think it's much a problem, but just as like uh, this kind of, again, sort of the difference between the philosophical approach to these questions versus the economic approach to these questions, right? So um, philosophically capitalism or anarcho-capitalism kind of allows for a wider range of things. I think um, economically, it really, there's certain things that make more sense and there's certain things that don't make very much sense. And the things that make the most sense are the most libertarian, voluntarist types of things. So that's, I think, where society would tend to go if it were under. Yeah, I mean, I suppose, I mean, I suppose, I just quickly, there could be prisons in a voluntary society as well. So I'm still not sure we've fully mm, pinpointed okay. the difference between the a capitalist and a voluntary society. But just just to go on to this, because this is this is very similar to the to, to the conversation I've had with David in regards to I struggle to find because the way I as I say, my my conceptualization of anarcho capitalism is obviously slightly different where I view it as a type of voluntarism. And I'm fine with other people who don't. But the problem is, is then I want to pin down, okay, well, then what is anarcho-capitalism? Like, just as I said, that obviously if we lived in a communist dictatorship, then we can't call it anarcho-capitalism because it's obviously violating certain aspects of what would define it as anarcho-capitalism. So my, my point is, to both to you and David and anybody else who has obviously the same view, is if, 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 if for example, forced communism would mean it's not anarcho-capitalism because that violates a, a defining tenant of anarcho-capitalism. Then what are the defining tenants of anarcho-capitalism and why aren't other violations of self-ownership and property rights also included? You know, if, if, a forced com if a forced commune or some kind of communist system, if that, if that couldn't be classed as anarcho-capitalism because it's violating the anarcho part because of the government style oppression and it's violating the capitalism part because of the communist style economy my point is is in my view at least drug laws and slavery if they don't violate the capitalist part which i think they kind of sort of do but that's arguable but that is debatable but the anarcho part i don't think is because as i say anarcho really means no rulers and a what, although we could quibble that a slave owner or someone who's enforcing drug laws through a private police force isn't technically a quote unquote government, I think they do qualify as a ruler because they're claiming the authority to tell you what you can put in your body in the case of drug laws or claim complete authority to rule you as a slave in the case of being a slave owner. Do you see what I mean? So it's like if those things don't violate anarcho capitalism, but there are things that do. Where's the line? And why is it different from the line that would define voluntarism? Well, I think the defining quality of anarcho-capitalism, I would say, is markets. That's sort of the central ingredient that I'm sort of staking everything on, is that um, the thing that anarcho-capitalism wants is to maximize the amount of choices that people have. And those include the choices of legal order that um, they can have. And so in different legal orders, you can have, you know, all sorts of different ways of violating the NAP. And they, it would include, um, you know, things that are less anarchistic, things that are less capitalistic, but it would still be anarcho-capitalism on the whole because those things would be in a free market. So the, when, it, when there starts to become a monopoly, say, that's when it starts to leave the world of anarcho-capitalism and become something else. Um, but, if, sorry. No, go ahead. 
Well, I was going to, but can we really call it a free market if there's slavery and drug laws and things of that nature? And also, and the other point I would make is I fully accept that market is a perfect distinction for the capitalism part, but what about the anarcho part? You know, because obviously market would apply to a, 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 a capitalism system that's not anarchist in any way, just as much as it would apply to an anarcho-capitalist. So I understand that the market... I mean, I mean, I agree, even in my definition of an anarcho-capitalism, the market part separates it from voluntarism because voluntarism, as I say, can be anarcho-capitalist, but it could, it could become kind of communist variant of voluntarism. But whereas obviously the capitalism part specifies the, the need for a market. But what about, I suppose, like, rather than the capitalism side, I'm more focusing on the anarcho part. That's the bit that, for me, really shouldn't allow for things like drug laws and slavery because that's too much like a government with regard to that oh and just sorry i know i've said a lot of things but one other thing as well is like i assume that in an anarcho-capitalist society because it's a, like we're saying it's a market we're talking about trade so theft would obviously not be recognized i assume correct me if i'm wrong theft would not be recognized as legitimate way of acquiring property it would have to be done through voluntary trade and again, I'm thinking, okay, well, then there's a NAT violation that's not allowed. Why would other NAT violations that are along the same kind of lines be allowed? Does that make sense? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I don't know what the, um, in what way a market is sort of separating from anarchism there. I mean, I think, I guess the thing is, the moment we have anarchism seems to be the moment that markets kind of take over. The, I, I don't really see a huge distinction between anarchism generally and sort of the free market fully extrapolated to anarcho-capitalism. So I don't make a whole lot of distinction between kind of anarchism generally and kind of market anarchism because you know the moment you have anarchism people are going to freely trade and freely associate and you know that i guess what what is the quality of a market where um where it kind of escapes being anarchistic well it's like i mean like today we have a market I don't think most people would describe it as a free market, but we have a market system. Mm -hmm. but obviously, we have a government that rules over it and regulates it. So it wouldn't be... So So while some people could call our current systems capitalism, they couldn't call it anarcho-capitalism because of the government. Now, right. I'm, I suppose from my point of view, just as the existence of a government that's claiming right to rule over people and regulate a market and what have you... Just, because, just as that would disqualify a potentially capitalist society from being anarcho-capitalist, I'm also of the opinion that slavery and drug laws would do the same thing for the same reason. They would also, it might well be capitalist, but it wouldn't be anarcho-capitalist because you've got some kind of ruler there. You know, like I say, like, 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 I mean, let's put it this way. If somebody, like my government, I recognise that my government is trying to rule me because they claim right over me to some, dis to some extent. Now, if, I have, if, if someone enslaves me, they're basically doing the same thing. To, you know, the, 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 the details are slightly different, but the fundamental claim over me, which is how I would describe ruling me, is, is there again. And the same with drug laws. In fact, any law other than the non-aggression principle that's imposed on people, I would argue is attempting to rule them. Because if I, if I tell you that you can't put something in your own body, then I'm claiming an authority to tell you what you can put over your own, in your own body, which basically means I'm claiming an authority over your self, your, your, your body. You know, it's the it kind, I suppose that's the kind of the way, I mean, like I say, I fully accept the capitalism market thing. It's, it's the anarcho thing that I'm really kind of focusing on with regards to, I don't understand how a society that's calling itself an anarchist capitalist society it can have um, any kind of coercive rule over somebody. And slavery and drug laws would both fit that bill, in my opinion. Well, it would be it'd be a rule justified by kind of uh, 
defense, basically, or it would be a rule that's there to enforce certain contractual agreements, basically. So, sorry, what you know, rule would be the rule on defense? Which one would be defensive? It would be be defending someone's right that is established by the laws put in place by contracts, contracts that the um, person, say, who's sold themselves into slavery has already agreed to, that it might, contracts that might say specifically that, okay, I hereby, you know, give myself over to this other person for X amount of time. And if I, you know. Yeah, so um, can I just cut in there just because yeah. The example's not what I'm talking about because when I said sla when I'm talking about slavery, I'm not talking about the voluntary version that we were talking about. I'm talking about being enslaved against your will because obviously the drug law thing is the same thing. If someone, if I, if I agree to be subject to some rules concerning drugs, then that's not the same as a drug law that's imposed on me against my will. Just like if I agree to sell myself into quote unquote slavery, that's not the same as somebody enslaving me against my will. So when I was talking about the slavery and drug laws thing, I wasn't talking about some kind of voluntary agreement that you're agreeing to ahead of time. I'm talking about like, you know, like, like the example David Friedman used is he's saying, well, like, you know, you could have some people who have, you know, that are in control of private police forces and courts and what have you that decide they want to police other people's drug, drug, drug use. Now, my point is, is they can't do that. They don't have the right to do that. And any attempt to do that would be just as much a crime as if they robbed you, raped you, murdered you and all the rest of it. I mean, not necessarily in severity, but in regards to what fundamental right is being violated. So when I say about like the slavery thing about like how something could be classed as defensive, my point is, is like I say, excluding voluntary contracts for a moment, actual slavery, actual someone saying, oh, I'm enslaving you against your will or drug laws, again, that are done against your will, both of those would qualify as ruling you. And I don't see how any laws that enforce them could really claim to be defensive in any way. Do you see what I mean? Right. I guess um, I'm not, well, I think that would, a system like that would probably violate, would go away from what we mean by anarcho-capitalism perhaps, but um, the other kind of slavery, the sort of voluntarist uh, form of slavery, it can still become coercive the moment that, you know, someone stops agreeing to it, right? I mean... Um, yeah, but if they stopped agreeing to it, they would just be in violation of contract. Um, it doesn't mean that someone would have the right to enslave them as punishment for violating their contract, because that wouldn't be a proportional... Um, you know, it's like if we had a contract, I mean, this might seem an extreme example, but just to kind of hammer my point home, if we had a contract that like I, you agreed to give me 10 pounds and I agreed to clean your windows and I violated that contract, you don't get to kill me as a punishment for violating that contract because that would obviously be a disproportional response. But what you do have the right to do Unless is it was say, in that I contract. owe you 10 pounds. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just talking about like... Yeah, I mean, well, this is the thing. I mean, the point is self-ownership. And this is, again, this is something that's true of voluntarism or anarcho-capitalism is you have the right to do with yourself what you want as long as you don't violate others. So, I mean, I can kill myself if I want to. That's my right yeah. as a self-owning individual. So selling myself into slavery and all of these things and whatever penalties and stuff that I want to put in there, again, that's it's still my choice. So it's not coercive because it was my... It was always my choice. It was always something that I've committed to. If I jump off a building, then I jumped off the building. If I change my mind halfway down, <laughs> you know, it's it's it doesn't change the fact that the decision was still mine in the first place. And um, and like I say, in the case of a contract, obviously it's not as um, finite as jumping off a building because it is possible for me to violate that contract. But if I do that, then I'm guilty of violating that contract. So I would be in the wrong. That doesn't mean that somebody could kill me or enslave me or or use force to me that's disproportionate to the offence that I committed because the offence that I've committed is just to violate a contract. 
if there's money involved, then I've obviously, you know, like, like I say, if, you, if it was to pay off a debt, then I still owe you the debt because I violated the contracts if there was something else involved. But with regards to what you would have the right to do, like I say, unless I specifically said that these penalties would apply, you know, unless I explicitly agreed that, look, if I bail out of this contract halfway through, you have the right to chop one of my legs off, then that's me. Again, that's me saying I'm giving you permission to chop one of my legs off, you know? So it's, it's, I don't see how the coercion can really be claimed at any point if it's my decision. And if it's not my decision, then it's not what we're talking about. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, okay, well, I guess I, I might have a slightly different view on like what the nap actually is that might kind of okay. deter us from the main crux of the conversation. I don't know, but um, uh, I guess I want to, I want to get back to this point that like, the thing is, um, a market anarchism or anarcho-capitalism is fundamentally like the broader scope thing that it allows for, um, you know, it's just, I just envision it as the, what happens when you get rid of the ruling government, right? It's just, like David Friedman is just analyzing what happens economically when you get rid of government. So um, in that scenario, you know what? Like there's a lot of people that value government. So that's sort of the thing is that the reason why it's such sort of a slippery concept and it can go and, you know, potentially, um, as you say, like communist sort of dictatorship that you might as well call that uh, sort of anarcho-capitalist in some sense. Like it, it might very well be if that's what the majority of people want, right? Um, it's just, you know, you get rid of the government and then what happens after that? Um, and economics is there to answer that question. And whenever you start explaining things economically, then it always works out to become capitalistic. It always works out, you know, you talk about like profit motive and you talk about um, all, you know, markets and all these competing entities. So like, I think the reason why you're hung up on uh, that it can produce all these different things is because it's in this area of the means to ends and not the ends within themselves. So um, it, it leaves open just a lot of possibilities by its nature. Um, but the main thing that anarcho-capitalists want is just to get rid of the government and basically see what happens, see what people actually want by how they choose to kind of spend their money. Yeah, I, I know what you're saying. I mean, and, and I do agree to an extent because I mean, I would certainly agree with the notion, um, and I don't know whether you'd put it this way, but I certainly would say that in an anarchist or a voluntary society, the free market is the default. You know, that's that's the economy you've already got. You know, like, for example, if we had a voluntary society, then free trade is the default there. And if you want to build some kind of commune, you've actually got to make concerted effort to do so with other consenting um, participants. So so the default w would always be what you might call capitalism. So I do agree with that aspect. The problem is, is when um, someone like David Friedman says, well, let's see how the market works without government. My problem is, is like, yeah, but you're only you're removing government in name only in the sense that you could argue that a society where there's no centralized ruling authority means there's no quote unquote government. But if there's decentralized ruling authorities like slave owners, like people that are imposing drug laws on people or anything else where there are certain some kind of 
authority or right over another person, that for me is essentially the same as government in regards to being a ruling entity. So that's my, 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 my point is, is I do agree with a lot of the anarcho-capitalist rhetoric about, you know, the market and if we get rid of government. But when I, but in my mind, getting rid of government means getting rid of that coercive ruling entity. It doesn't just mean getting rid of this particular type of ruling entity that's centralised in a way that we would define as government. It means, like, I mean, that's why I characterise anarchism as no rulers rather than no government, although obviously no rulers implies no government as well, but because it's not just talking about government, it's talking about any kind of ruling entity. So if, I'm a, if, I, if I declare myself king of three other people, that's probably not big enough to call me a government, but I am a ruler. I am claiming authority over three other people against their will, you know, not as part of some kind of voluntary arrangement. So that's the kind of that's the kind of crux for me. And I don't see how a mark I don't see how a free market can express or even be characterized as a free market all the time you have these coercive agents. Uh-huh. Well, see that but see that points to the kind of main point that I was making, which is that I think voluntarism is just a more specific thing that anarcho-capitalism is like the world you get when you remove specifically sort of the government. And I think, you know, the world that you're trying to um, aim towards, and I think is, you know, very good, um, is uh, a world without any rulers more generally, but that that makes it more specific and that by making it more specific that way, I think it makes it, um, you know, not something that every single uh, person of every single like ideological background is going to agree to. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would kind of agree to that. I mean, I suppose all I would say is I mean, I do agree that voluntarism is more specific than anarchism. It's one of the reasons why I prefer voluntarism as a term, because it's more explicit about the whole self-ownership thing. But I would say that anarchism is explicitly no rulers. It's probably not so explicit on all of the other aspects of self-ownership, but it is explicitly about no rulers. Because, I mean, if, if I ask, I mean, if you ask people for definitions of words, you get different answers from different people. But I would argue, and I, and I don't know if you agree with this, but I would argue that probably the most agreeable definition of anarchism that I can't see anyone really disputing is the definition that anarchism means no rulers. More than saying anarchism means no government, because as I say, a king's not a government, but that would be a ruler and that would violate anarchy. Would you not agree? Um... Yeah, well, it might be the most agreeable definition of anarchism. It's, that's kind of semantic, though. I think the more, it's just the more agreeable um, thing, generally, is the removal of government. But my, my, my point is, sorry to labor this point, but my, my point is, is if we agree, and tell me if you disagree on any of these things, but if we uh -huh. agree that anarchism means no rulers, and if we agree that a slave owner or somebody who's imposing drug laws on people is acting as a ruler, then for me, the logic is that a society that has slave owners or drug laws can't be described as anarchist. Well, I think it can be described as more anarchist than the society we have right now. Uh, it, it, well, maybe, maybe not. But uh, my point is, is it's either anarchist or it's not. I mean, it's like if you had a small government, you wouldn't call that anarchist. No matter how small it was, if it had a government, you wouldn't call it anarchist, even if you might say, well, it's closer to it than, you know, there, there's like, uh, you know, there's like, you know, like, for example, the slaves on the plantations were often freer in like uh, the West Indies and the Caribbean islands than they were on mainland America, but they were all slaves and they were all denied their freedom on a fundamental way. And no one would argue that they weren't, you know what I mean? So it's like, my point is, is if you've got rulers, you don't have anarchism. If you have anarchism, you don't have rulers. And like, although there's other aspects we can quibble about whether you can still have this, that and the other in an anarchist society, the one thing that, I always, it's certainly like how I've conceptualized anarchism, 
the one thing you can't have in an anarchist society is any kind of ruling authority, no matter how big or small. Like it's like David seems to focus on a centralized ruling authority. But for me, anarchism doesn't mean no centralized ruling authority. It just means no rulers of any kind, you know? So, um, you know, like whether, whether you're a ruler of one or a ruler of 10 million, you're a ruler, you know? Um, and the fundamental thing that defines you as being a ruler is the authority or right that you're claiming over another person. Well, where does that authority come from? I mean, I don't think it's, coming from just your claim of it. I think it's coming from like your physical power over other people. So, you know, I think the... Um, yeah, but that's, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but that's, yeah. that's more, I mean, that's more along the lines of might makes right. But also I'm not talking about whether it's possible to do these things. Cause one of the things that David said to me about, like he said, well, what if you have a, what if someone rapes someone in your free society? Is it no longer a free society? And I was like, well, no, it's still a free society because if someone, we're not saying that no crimes occur. We're saying that we understand what a crime, we, under, we recognize it as a crime. We don't recognize it as a legitimate practice. The problem is with the drug laws and the slavery is he saying that there are potential versions of anarcho-capitalism where drug laws and slavery exist as legitimate things, as something that's actually allowed in the definition. Now, my point is, is well, communist dictatorships wouldn't be allowed in the definition. I assume rape, theft and murder wouldn't be allowed in the definition. So why are drug laws and slavery allowed in the definition? You know, I mean, I, I'm trying to I'm trying to find the, the thing that identifies anarcho-capitalism that wouldn't allow these things, but does allow these things, you know, and I, I just I suppose I can't pinpoint that. Uh huh. Well. Well, my point would be that like even a minarchy I would be willing to sort of classify a certain kind of minarchy as anarchistic because um, it, because authority is so much dependent on power that like a small enough minarchy in um, kind of the tools that it can utilize, that's something that is fundamentally escapable if people want to escape it. So like at a certain point, government becomes small enough that it is fundamentally easy to escape from, is fundamentally easy to secede. So like, um, you know, if you get a small enough government, you know, they don't have the weapons, they don't have like the manpower to sustain it. And then it breaks down. It doesn't matter who's claiming, you know, whatever the laws are, that sort of thing. In, in like uh, anarcho-capitalism where slavery is allowed, well, it could sort of, there's the environment that it can also give us the tools to make that slavery not allowed by um, sustaining like the market as a whole and you could have private companies say that are you know these rights enforcement agencies that David Friedman talks about that um, fundamentally disagree with sort of the whatever the mainstream order you know legal order is that somehow justifies slavery and it might be that um, these rights enforcement agencies that don't recognize slavery as legitimate could uh, come in and kind of earn their spot on the market if that's something that people want and um, go about like freeing the slaves. They could come in and represent the slaves and um, you know there might be even a profit motive in doing that. They might uh, kind of uh, you know, have a debt either to, or they might be able to kind of earn the um, support of those slaves once they are able to free them. So, uh, you know, I guess that's, that's the thing where like, 
we have to sort of pull the stuff out of the abstract and put it into like tangibleness. So um, by, by sort of analyzing this stuff economically, um, we can attempt to like see what the, you know, we can define these things more tangibly and see like, I don't know how, how the, um, how like power really works and how like people can, you know, when, when people have choices, right? When they have choices like on the market, that gives, that gives them the fundamental right of choice, right? So that's why I think, you know, the, the maximizing of like choice as the central thing there, um, as opposed to, uh, you know, something like self-ownership, something like property rights, that maintains this, um, level of like selection where people can choose kind of the rules that they want to live by and the rules that they want society to follow. And that can change, that can change within the anarcho-capitalist context to become worse or it can change to become better. And anarcho-capitalism itself is essentially indifferent, but the people within that system should not be indifferent. They should be, you know, generally, um, we should expect them to be generally more ethical than say they are today. So um, yeah, that's kind of my whole point, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I do disagree that minicism could be described as anarchism. Um, so there's perhaps a, a, de a difference with our definitions there. I mean, perhaps I'm being more, I suppose from your perspective, you probably think I'm being too absolutist with, with my definitions. Um, but for me, I mean, the, the word minicism is the word for a reason. It's not anarchism. That's why it's called minicism and not anarchism. So I would dispute that. I mean, and I, and, and I suppose that's where I'm kind of holding fast with my definitions, although I understand, you know, the flexibility of definitions and interpretations. But for me, like saying we'll remove this centralized ruling authority, but still allow decentralized ruling authorities and we'll call that anarchism just doesn't wash with me because for me, anarchism is no rulers. It's not it's not specifying a centralized ruler that you're not allowed to have. It just means no rulers. So. That's where I'm coming from in that aspect. And that's partly with our different definitions, because obviously if you would view minicism as potentially being a, a, like, you know, described as anarchism, then that's the difference that we have. I'm not as flexible as you with my definition of anarchism. For me, if you've got any kind of ruler, government or otherwise, then it's not anarchism. I'm, I'm happy to call it capitalism still. You know, like I say, like people call the society we live in today capitalism and Although I know plenty of ANCAPs that like to dispute that because they say, oh, it's not real capitalism and stuff like that. But, you know, you can say that because we have a market, we have trade, we have enough trappings that fit the definition of capitalism, but we don't have the freedom that qualifies as anarchism and even a free market. I mean, this is the other thing. Surely for something to be, surely for a market to be really described as a free market, you need that freedom of self-ownership because if you don't have that, is it really a free market? So we don't describe the free market because things are available for free. We describe it as the free market because it's laissez-faire. It's everyone, it's leave us alone market. It's, it's you know, so for me, the rule, the, the idea, the whole idea of leave me alone to do what I want is that the do what I want thing is contingent that I leave other people alone to do what they want. And it's almost like, we're having the leave me alone so I can do what I want without the contingency that I have to leave other people alone so they can do what they want. And it's like, well, you know, it's all very well, these people that want to create private police forces to enforce drug laws or to recruit slaves or whatever, well, not recruit, but, you know, enslave slaves, 
and they're saying, well, I'm doing what I want. But it's like, yeah, but you're infringing on the slaves and the people who are enforcing drug laws on on their right to do what they want. It's not it's not capitalism across the board. And everyone's enjoying this free market. It's and then it becomes like then, in my view, it becomes no less corrupt and arbitrary than the system that we have now. Because the problem we have now with our market is that we have this giant coercive organization that completely destroys any of the free market principles with its interference. Now, all right, it's only um, the fact that it's a centralized authority means we call it government. But if you've got any kind of uh, authority, centralized or decentralized, that's violating people's right to... Because to, surely... Like, like, you know, like drug laws for me are a violation of property rights. Capitalism is built on property rights. And anarcho-capitalism is built on, you know, property rights without a, a ruler interfering with it. So, again, so I don't want to keep coming back to the same point, but that's kind of, that's where I'm coming from on that. Is I don't see that. I mean, that's my fundamental disagreement with that conceptualization of anarcho-capitalism. I don't, it, it kind of, like... Under my definition of anarcho-capitalism, where I view it as a type of voluntarism, like just voluntarism with a specified economic preference, or rather a type of anarchism with a specified economic preference, in that view, um, anarcho-capitalism works and it's consistent and the property rights you're exercising come from your self-ownership and the rights that you're exercising are the same rights everyone else is exercising and it works. Like, like everything you say about anarcho-capitalism in the context of voluntarism, I agree with. But as soon as we remove the context of voluntarism and allow for coercion, whether it's the full level of a government or the more... Uh, isolated instances of like a private police force enforcing drug laws or or a slave owner enslaving people once you have that then all of those beautiful things about free trade go out the window you know the, the whole thing we complain about why we don't get value for money from governments is because they use coercion against us well surely we're going to have the same problem with slave owners and people that can exert similar coercion and violation of our freedom but I don't know that they can exert a similar, you know, force against us because, you know, it goes to like de facto versus de jure uh, types of rule. So like, if you're just claiming authority over someone, that doesn't make that, that doesn't mean that you actually have authority over someone. That's just a claim of authority. So the reason why I, I say that like minarchism can be within the realm of anarchism is because like it ultimately, it, it leaves the realm of like de facto rule and goes to the realm of de jure rule. And when it's de jure, it's like, okay, I don't have to do that. You know, it's not a real authority. It's just kind of, um, it's a, well, it's frankly a kind of, voluntary arrangement. Um, and so if people want a minarchy in anarcho-capitalism, I think it would be able to provide that for them. But if people don't want a minarchy and if they want to run off and do their own thing, anarcho-capitalism is there to facilitate that as well. So like that's kind of the big distinction. That's why I think that like but it's like saying if people want a government, anarcho-capitalism can provide that. But if it does, it wouldn't be anarcho-capitalism anymore, would it, would it not? Well, I think it, it depends. It depends on like what are we really talking about when, because um, you know, anarcho-capitalists talk about the privatization of government services. They don't talk about like the. Um, elimination of those services, right? And when the services are privatized, what we really mean by that is we want those to be placed on the open market and we want them to be competing with other institutions that off offer similar services. But by what rules? By what rules? Just, well, by... <laughs> by whatever rules facilitate um, 
facilitate people's ability to choose? Because, I mean, the, the reason I'm asking is because I understand that just saying this is not anarcho-capitalism doesn't wave some magic wand that prevents it from ever happening. Yeah, you know, it's all very well me saying this is a voluntary society and if people start ruling each other, that's not voluntarism. It's all very well me saying that. That doesn't magically prevent people from ruling each other. You know, there's still obviously, you know, the diligence involved and all of that. So I'm not talking about whether, like, for example, these things can exist in these societies, but whether they are viewed as legitimate by the ideology. So like an anar anarcho, like, if, like what I'm saying is, is if, if I came in, say, say you own your house, right? Say I came in with force, with guns and all the rest of it, and I kicked you out of your house and I just seized it. Let's say it's because I'm a commie and I want to seize it for the commune. I mean, it doesn't really matter. I could just be a private person. I want to seize it for myself, whatever. But my point is, is, and you correct me if I'm wrong on here, but an anarcho-capitalist society would not view that as legitimate. You're not, I'm not, the. In, in, according to anarcho-capitalism, the rightful owner of your house is you. The fact that I've come in and used force and taken it from you just makes me a thief. It doesn't make me the new owner of your property. Would that be true to say? In the context of anarcho-capitalism. Well, in the context of anarcho-capitalism, I think it, it fundamentally de depends on what like the what the courts work out to say about that. I mean, like there is, there is, um, you know, potentially communist legal orders. Um, and those legal orders would recognize, especially like, you know, land rights are of course sort of in a controversial region um, where, you know, there's sort of different ideas of what qualifies as property there. In a house, it's a little less, uh, a little more straightforward that, you know, the- Yeah, we uh, could have a know. whole other conversation about land ownership, which- I know, yeah. To now, but that's something we could talk about another time. That would be a good <laughs> well. but, but yeah, no, I get what you're saying. If, if the property is unambiguously yours, like a house or something that's just property and there's no, you know, like I say, things can people people can dispute over land and stuff like that, which we can get into another time. But assuming you've got it's your house, it's your property. Up until I took it from you, there was no dispute. It was your property. You know, if you were going to trade it in the capitalist market, everyone would have you know accept that. But before you got a chance to, I came in with my guns, with my force, with my what I would view illegitimate means and i steal it from you now what i'm saying is, is in a voluntary society there's no magic wand that prevents that from happening there's no magic wand that guarantees no crimes ever committed but in a voluntary society that would be viewed a crime i wouldn't be deemed the new owner of your house just because i've got the might to possess it i would be viewed as a thief who just happens to be strong enough to rob you and no one's able to stop me kind of thing but the fact but what i'm saying is, is according to the ideology of voluntarism the house rightfully belongs to you. So we're, we, we are making a kind of moral assertion. Now, it, what I'm saying is I'm not asking about whether a anarcho-capitalist society could devolve into a communist dictatorship. I'm saying if it did, it would no longer be anarcho-capitalist. Whether, whether we think that's likely to happen or not is irrelevant. What I'm saying is, is at, one, at a certain point, it's gonna step over a certain line of characteristics where it can no longer be classed as anarcho-capitalism. And my point is, is with the voluntarism thing, I'm saying that any time, any kind of coercion or violation of self-ownership is viewed as legitimate by the society, then it's not a voluntary society. That doesn't mean these crimes don't occur, because they might still occur, but they are viewed as crime. If someone rapes someone, they're a rapist. They're not that person's rightful husband or, or whatever. You know what I mean? If I steal your house, I'm a thief. I'm not the new rightful owner in a voluntary society. So these things happening would be counter to that. And if the society devolved to such a point where these things were happening and accepted on a societal level and viewed as legitimate, then we no longer have a voluntary society. The reason we don't have a voluntary society right now or an anarchist society is because we have these coercive agents and all of these things that basically disqualify it from meeting that criteria. So my point is, is there's obviously certain criteria that 
you need to define it as anarcho-capitalism. No matter how loose your definition of anarcho-capitalism is, there's got to be something that would separate it from a polar opposite, like a communist dictatorship is like, you know, the obvious opposite of that, because you've got the economic opposite and the government thing. So what I'm saying is, is there's, 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 there's trappings there of what makes up a communist dictatorship, and there's trappings of what makes up an anarcho-capitalist society. And what I'm saying is if, if one becomes the other, then we recognise that one's become the other. It's no longer legitimate. You know, me seizing your house is not legitimate in a narco-capitalist society. It might be in the communist one if I'm part of the communist dictatorship, you know? So this is the point I'm making. So, like, in a, um, in a society where slavery and drug laws, not that they occur, but that they are considered legitimate on a societal level, allowed, if you like, then then I think it fails to qualify as it certainly would fail to qualify as voluntarism. But my point is, is that I've, it seems like it would also fail to qualify as anarchism. Um, I mean, only just about qualify as capitalism if you're using a very loose definition. But I, 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 yeah, it's, it's the anarchism side of it. I'm sorry, go, I, I went, I said low too many things there. But just to go back to the thing, if I if I stole your house from you, would we agree that in an anarcho-capitalist society, it's still viewed as your house, not mine, even though I've I'm in possession of it. Well, the thing the thing is, like anarcho-capitalism is not a statement on what the legal order should be. That's that would be my central claim. It's this it's just the um, overarching system and whatever the legal order says it can say a number of different things on that. So um, like, no, I don't think that, uh, you know, that a, a legal order that recognized people going around and stealing other people's houses um, as legitimate, I don't think that necessarily precludes it from being anarcho-capitalist. And I would say that also, you know, um, I know, I remember you, uh, you're you fond of this analogy to like the grassland versus the desert. There's one thing and then there's a different thing and we can distinguish those things as each being different, but there, there is a gradual gray area line between them. So I think that's, that's kind of what we're talking about um, with regards to how anarcho-capitalism um, is a very different thing from obviously a communist dictatorship, but it's it's kind of uh, where anarchy where anarcho capitalism ends and where a communist dictatorship begins. That's that line is not an absolute thing. That's you know gradient. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Touche for using my own analogy against me. <laughs> um, but but yeah. But, to, but but thing is in that analogy because obviously my desert grassland thing is to do with my peace agreement about when we're setting a universal standard for the NAP and saying okay we we know this is definitely a violation of the NAP we know this is definitely not but there's a grey area in between similar to the desert grassland thing and what I'm saying is, is although there is a grey area there's also a limit. That gray area doesn't go on forever. Eventually, we have to draw a line and say, now we're in the black and white. Now you're definitely violating the non-aggression principle. And I would say the same thing with regards to, even if we accept the gradient that you're talking about with regards to defining an anarcho-capitalist society and a communist society and saying, okay, they're very different, but there's a fuzzy edge in between. Okay, that's fine. There might be a fuzzy edge in between, but there's still got to be a limit. There's still got to be a line where, okay, now you are black and white, in a communist dictatorship, or now you are black and white in an anarcho-capitalist society. And even if we admit there's a gray area in between, my point is, is what really belongs in that gray area and why, and what really belongs in the black and white, now you're definitely anarcho-capitalism, now you're definitely not, and why. That's what I'm trying to pin down. Like what that, what's that, um, what's that criteria, you know? Like, like the thing is like with the non-aggression principle thing, if you're violating someone's self-ownership, you're violating the non-aggression principle. The, you know, like the, the gradient thing is there are certain times when it's a debatable whether you are violating someone's self-ownership. But once you've gotten past that, and it's like the same thing, if you're definitely violating property rights, 
for example, I'm not saying this is the the line, but let's say, for example, we said that was the line. Let's we say, OK, it's not self-ownership, but it's property rights. I mean, I might still take issue with that because property rights kind of comes from self-ownership. But OK, we can say, OK, you can violate self-ownership kind of, but you can't violate actual property rights. I think they're kind of almost one and the same. But let's say we kind of say well, they're not property rights only deals with property and self-ownership deals with people's ownership over themselves and you can say well there is that difference there my point is is what well, okay what well, where 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 on this spectrum is that line where when can we say right now this is no longer an anarcho-capitalist society and when can we say now this is definitely an anarcho-capitalist society even if there's an area where we're not so sure in between there still needs to be a black and white standard if that makes sense Right. So I would say that um, that standard is not in the realm of like the severity of uh, moral infla infraction. It's to do with um, the f overall like physical world kind of system that's in place. It's the, the um, overarching economy. So like a communist dictatorship is very non anarcho capitalist, specifically when it is, um, it is basically inescapable. When um, you, you stop being able to choose between that and some alternative system. So, I mean, a communist dictatorship would definitely, what we consider to be a communist dictatorship, that would certainly disqualify it from being anarcho-capitalist. But, you know, only in the basis of um, that it's, that it is constraining people's choice to keep those people away from you know, the full uh, set of options that would that would be there for them on an open market. I mean, I suppose the reason why I chose communist dictatorship as a perfect opposite to anarcho-capitalism is because there's two elements in both ideologies. Anarcho-capitalism, you've got the an anarchism and you've got the capitalism. And with the communist dictatorship, you've got the dictator part and then you've got the communism part. So for me, the dictatorship part is the opposite to the anarchism part and the communism part is the opposite to the capitalism part. That's why I kind of viewed it as a, as a perfect opposite. If you want to find the most polar opposite to anarcho-capitalism, then you've got a dictatorship, which is the opposite to the anarchism and the communism is the opposite to the capitalism. Now, my point is, is the communism capitalism thing we're kind of on the same page we can recognize that pretty well but my problem is is a lot of what um is being described by both you and david that could potentially exist in this quote-unquote anarcho-capitalism for me that's like you've you've got the capitalism part maybe so you you know not the communist part of of the that's different from the communist dictatorship but you haven't got the dictatorship bit different because there's still a dictatorship. It might not be a centralized one, but there's still this dictatorship, even if it's kind of fragmented and decentralized. It's funny because like the way that I conceptualize it, I almost, you know, think that the capitalism part is the thing that is a little bit more looser than the anarchist part. Um, because, you know, I think that a real hardcore anarchy is one that people still retain the choice to go back to um, a world of government and coercion, right? It's just, we're trying to maximize choice as the central ingredient there. Um, now, like your point about anarchy not being... Um, against rulers as opposed to government it's like um there's no the point of like anarcho-capitalism is that there's no there's no ruler that you can't fundamentally like escape from if you wanted to that if if 
people generally accepted like a different legal order or if there was an organization that you could turn to to say that I don't want to be a I don't want to live under this ruler anymore. Can you please like offer me, you know, the weapons, the legal protections, the whatever, like that's there physically, tangibly to allow me to escape whatever the um, ruler that wants to rule over me. I think I, I see a problem with that line of thinking because then I think you lose the distinction even for government because I can envisage people that are under government rule who could argue that it's actually easier for them to escape that by perhaps moving to another country although they're all under government rule but you know that, that that might be easier for some people to leave a government than it would be a more decentralized kind of ruling authority I mean like when David spoke about the potential for drug laws to exist, he didn't talk about how easy or not it would be for someone to escape such things. You know, if you're if you're living in an area and you can't really afford to leave that area any more than you could afford to emigrate to another country, and you have some kind of um, dictator wannabe who's using his private police force to, you know, enforce drug laws on you or enslave you or whatever else, then that's just as much a hopeless situation as somebody who's living in a complete under a complete government that may actually be slightly less oppressive because maybe they don't have drug laws or maybe they don't have slavery and maybe they allow you to renounce your citizenship and stuff like that you know so there's um i'm, I'm, I'm sorry one other thing um i i think that's worth pointing out in this conversation just so that we don't talk past each other and so that our terms are probably defined whenever i talk about um anarchism and government and rulers I, I, dis, I distinguish rulers from leaders and I distinguish governments from like what I would call voluntary collectives. So like, because some, some people have spoken to me about what they call minichism, but they're talking about, or like, or sometimes I'll describe to people like the voluntary collectives that I kind of advocate for in a free society. I say, look, we don't all have to just trust the free market. We can have collectives. We can have things that would be like government with regards to having this collective and even having social programs and stuff like that, but it wouldn't be able to exert coercion. It wouldn't be able to exert ruling authority. It would only be able to, like everyone involved would have to be willing participants and this organization wouldn't have any special rights or powers beyond any individual. So for me, that wouldn't be minichism because minichism still involves a ruling government, no matter how small. So that's an important distinction to make. So, for example, like, say, for example, what I'm advocating for with this whole make the nap the law thing. If we made the nap the law here in England, we don't have to completely dismantle or disperse what was the ruling government. We just have to remove them as a ruling entity. But everything that's there, like the infrastructure, the collective that you have it, could, re could remain and could continue in a free society as a voluntary collective and doesn't matter how big it is it could still be nationwide the whole country could still be part of it and it could still run almost identical as it does today although i doubt that would happen but you know it could still in theory run identical as it runs today the only difference is it would no longer wield any authority over any person so me who lives here i wouldn't have to be part of that collective and i wouldn't have to leave the country either i would just say look i don't agree with that and you've got no power over me and and everyone would have to just accept that that wouldn't be a government, even though it would have many of the trappings of government, because the, 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 the fundamental point is what I would say is qualifying you as ruling someone. It's another point I make when I'm kind of trying to sell this whole idea of making the nap the law, because a lot of people say, well, what gives you the right to enforce the law? You know, you're moaning about governments imposing laws on people, but you want to impose laws. And I'm like, yeah, but the law that I want to in impose, for want of a better word, doesn't require any ruling power like if i say to you i'm going to use force against you if you violate me or anybody else i'm not ruling you i'm just making a threat of defensive force but if i say to you i'm going to use force on you to um to decide what you put in your body or i'm going to use force on you to make you work for me you know and all of this then i am exerting a, an authority over you then i am exerting so that's the fundamental fundamental it's not the size of the organization me that's the problem it's the nature of it 
So you can have a giant voluntary collective as big as any government. If it doesn't exert any coercive power over anybody, then it's not a ruling government. It's a voluntary collective. And then you can have a really tiny organization that's to too small to qualify as a government. But because they are exerting rule over people, like slave owners or something like that, then they do qualify as rulers. So that's another important distinction. I just wanted to make that clarification just so we don't talk past each other in this conversation. Like you might say minicism and mean one thing and I mean another. That's what I mean. When I'm talking about anarchism and government, I'm not talking about not having no, I mean, this is one other thing. Sorry, no, this is one other thing. I don't like it when people talk about individualism versus collectivism. I know what they mean. They mean about rights. They mean about individualism as in people having individual rights versus collectivism, which is the idea that the collective has rights over the individual. That kind of collectivism is forced collectivism. It's oppressive. It's coercive. It's basically what ruling governments are. I don't want no part of that. But I'm not against voluntary collectives. You know, and, and, and equally so, I'm not, I don't have, I, like, you know, an, a single individual that uses force to rule over me and violate my rights is, is a ruler. You know, like, he, he might not be the same type of ruler as the government in size and other descriptions, but he is the same type of, he is the same type in the sense that he is a ruler. He's, he's committing that same um, crime of claiming authority over me. Right. Well, I, I, just, I just don't think that the claim of authority over someone is the actual crime. I think it's the physical ability to um, rule over someone. Yeah. And yeah, using okay, that. yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, it still requires the action with it. But, but I suppose the point is, is if I, if I, if I aggress against you, as a criminal and society, you know, like say, you know, we live in a society that understands what crimes are in some kind of coherent way. And I aggress against you, like I rob your car or I steal your house or whatever it is, it's recognized as a crime. It's not viewed as a legitimate action from me. So like, yeah, I could make a claim over your house, but it doesn't matter if I'm, the, if I'm making that claim because people will ignore it and I don't have the power to follow through and all the rest of it. Yeah, I, I, I totally take your point on that. And it's, it's a, an important point to make. But my point is, is it's about what's accepted as part of the ideology. You know, just like I said that the anarcho-capitalist system would not allow a communist dictatorship as part of its ideology. It, would, it wouldn't view those forms of ownership as legitimate. It would view it as just some kind of criminal corruption of what anarcho-capitalism is. And once you had a communist dictatorship, it wouldn't be anarcho-capitalism anymore. And I'm just kind of saying, I'm, I'm, I'm using the same thing with anarchism as a more general term. And I'm like saying, well, surely, for anything to qualify as anarchism, there can't be rulers. If there's rulers, then it no longer qualifies as anarchism. Now, obviously, one lone person saying, I claim rule over that person, doesn't mean it. But if society accepts that rule, if it's viewed legitimate, you know, um, on a, a little bit like how, you know, when slave, before slavery was abolished, it was viewed as legitimate by society. Now it's viewed as a crime. That's the kind of difference because we no longer live. I mean, we kind of do in other ways, but you know, so the, the point of an anarchist society would mean that rulers are no longer legitimate. They're no longer deemed to be a legitimate part of society. If it's an anarchist society, they would be viewed as criminals. Anyone who tried to rule, whether they were successful or not, would be viewed as either committing a crime or attempting to commit a crime. Whereas the, my problem is with David's conceptualization of anarcho-capitalism is he's allowing an anarcho-capitalist society where rulers are allowed. Not just that they're allowed as in it happens and these are crimes that we don't stop, but they're actually, it's actually allowed as in it's even viewed as legitimate. It's even viewed as, yeah, that's fine. That's still part of anarcho-capitalism. You know what I'm saying? Like if I robbed your house, that wouldn't be viewed part of anarcho-capitalism. But if I enslave you or enforce drug laws on you, that somehow is, and I don't see why. But it's not that it's necessarily viewed as legitimate is that it could be it could be viewed as legitimate under a certain legal order that might exist in anarcho-capitalism but by the same token um it might not be viewed as legitimate by a different 
legal order that comes to power. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I am, I am working under the acceptance that both you and David aren't advocating for these oppressive societies, or even saying that they're likely in a narco-capitalist society. But I'm, but I'm, but even the idea that they could happen and still qualify as a narco-capitalism is something I take issue, I, because. And like I say, I don't think it's completely unfounded because there are, you know, like, and why I keep bringing up the communist dictatorship thing is just because there are examples I can give you of a society that would fail to be qualifying as an anarcho capitalism. So there's, there's criteria there that says, look, if you step out of this, this isn't an anarcho capitalism anymore. My problem is, is why is drug laws and slavery not part of that, you no longer anarcho capitalism anymore, when in my view, it might not be violating the capitalist part, it's certainly violating the anarcho part. Well, I guess I want to go back to the point about like um, you know, ruling authorities. Mm -hmm. I think the reason why I want to focus so much on like the fact that that's a, a, a physical thing and not just an ideological thing um, is because I think to become like a proper ruling authority that is something that people can't escape from. It needs to be, needs to have like monopolistic power. And so like, that's the way that, um, that's the way that, you know, something goes from anarcho-capitalism to not being anarcho-capitalism is when it, be, when it gains that monopoly. Um, and so, so like, uh, could you that, know, sorry, could the, that come down to a difference with our, de I mean, it, it might be that we just got, is this just down to our difference in definition of an anarchism then? Because are you saying that the, that it's, it's only a centralized ruling authority with a monopoly that qualify that, that disqualifies it as anarchism like you like 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 a society that has many ruling authorities without anyone claiming outright monopoly that would be anarchism in your view still P yes on the, on the practical level though on the practical level it would still be anarchy because um because uh it's just you can you still retain that choice of not living under that system. The problem um, is, sorry, can I just cut yeah. in? Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but I just want to cut in with a problem I view with that though. And it reminds okay. me of a conversation I have with an objectivist where he kind of took me by surprise, where he suddenly put up this picture saying, we live in an anarchist world. And I was like, what are you talking about? He says, we live in an anarchist world. And I was like, okay, you need to explain that a little bit further. And he says, well, Think about it. We have all of these governments, but we don't have one centralized ruling one world government that rules over them all. Mm -hmm. So we live in an anarchist world. And I, I mean, I rejected that because they're still rulers. But if I take your definition, then that becomes a valid statement. We do live in an anarchist world because on a global scale, we don't have one centralized ruling government with a monopoly on force. We've got many competing ones. And then all of a sudden, you could call the world we live in today anarchism just because all of these ruling authorities on a global scale, you know, like when we talk about a nation, we think, oh, well, that's that's one centralized ruling authority. It isn't a nation. But if we talk on a global scale, then all of a sudden it becomes many rulers again. And that and that's why I kind of resist the idea of allowing a system where there's many rulers being classed as anarchism just as much as I resist the idea of a centralized ruling authority being anarchism because as I say for me anarchism is about no rulers whether it's a centralized one with a monopoly or whether it's many decentralized ruling authorities none of which have a monopoly but they're all just competing it, it, that's not the part that decides whether it's anarchism in my view the part that decides it's anarchism is the ruling part does that make sense well I think from from the people's perspective, from individuals' perspective, there's no way in which you can call this world anarchistic. But from the country's perspective, I think it is anarchistic, um, just because you know they 
they don't have you know, a ruling authority over them. But you know, to your point, yeah, um, it's not for from the individual's perspective anarchy because in the regions that each of these nation states existed. But that's um, my but that's my point about why a society that has drug laws and slave owners and stuff wouldn't be anarchist on an individual level for the exact same reason. Like all I'm doing is like like what I'm saying is is what you're talking about on a national level of saying, okay, well, we have this centralized authority that makes it not anarchism. But then when we don't have one centralized authority with a monopoly of force and you've got lots of little ruling authorities, then it is anarchism. I'll say, okay, well, if we go out to the world, we already have that situation. We've got many rulers, but we don't have one ruling authority on a global scale. So my point is, is for the exact same reason that you would say it's not anarchism globally on an individual level, I'm saying, yeah, but if we go into the national level, that's the exact same reason why it wouldn't be anarchism nationally if you didn't have a centralised government with ruling authority, but you had many rulers. That's kind of, that would be the same global scenario just down on the national level. Does that make sense? Okay, but there wouldn't, if it, if it becomes monopolistic on, over like a territory, that's when it starts to become government and not um, anarcho-capitalistic. So is it the geographical territory then that's the part that is the... Well, it's, it's the place in the market, right? So it could be that... Um, because a slave owner is obviously claiming territory, not necessarily geographical. Territory over individuals, basically. Mm. So, I mean... Um, those... Sorry, that's what I was long. saying. Is it geographical? Because there's obviously a territorial claim in any kind of ruling authority, but the difference in a, in, in a government, as we think of it, is that there's a geographical territory involved there. Whereas, like, a, like I mean, I had a similar thing with, with David Freeman because he, he was saying, well, no, a, a government's different from a... When I was asking, well, how is a government different from a slave owner? And he said, well, he said the slave owner only claims ownership over the slave. Government's claiming ownership over a whole territory and everybody within it. And I'm like, okay, so then is geographical territory, is that the defining thing that separates, you know, uh, uh, something that would not qualify as anarchism from something that would not? Geography would be a strong indication that uh, something has become government if it's a monopoly under, or under that territory. Um, but it's... I don't think that's necessarily the thing that makes it government. Um, I think it's is the it what place. Makes it rulers, though. Um, I I don't think so. I think it's again like a very strong indication that it's. Um, the reason I ask is because we are working on the premise that we do agree that anarchism means no rulers. Now, obviously, if we mean that, if we agree, right. we say anarchism means no one ruler with a monopoly, then that's slightly different to just saying no rulers at all. But then I say the problem with that definition is, is that you can then describe us being anarchistic on a global scale. Right, but okay, it's, it's the place in the market that I'm saying um, is the defining feature that makes uh a situation a you know ruler right um if let's see what's what's an example uh i mean just like does a slave owner not have a place in the market though because he's obviously he's claiming ownership over a, a certain portion of the workforce for example Okay, but that's that's a claim. That's a certain legal claim, and that has to be backed up by the court system. And the point of like anarcho-capitalism is that there's more than one court system. There's many different courts with different legal concepts, and as long as the there are some courts that might like 
uh, be allowed to recognize that slavery is wrong and that um, if a slave came to them and was like, hey, I don't want to uh, be a part of this contract, you know, or, or however they became a slave, say, um, uh, they don't want to be a slave anymore and the court upholds that choice that they've made. Um, and there's like a rights enforcement agency there that can also physically like uphold that, then that's the thing that makes it anarcho-capitalistic. And that's the thing that restricts us from calling um, that slave owner in the situation necessarily a ruling authority. But I mean, that would only work if the person volunteered themselves into slavery again. But again, going. But maybe they, maybe they didn't. But there's, there's still. Um, but my point still... is, if they didn't, yeah. But if they didn't volunteer themselves into slavery, then if they go to some court and say, "I don't want to be a slave anymore," why would the court care? They didn't want to be a slave in the first place. So if the, if if their will to not be a slave didn't matter when they were first forced into slavery why does it matter however long down the line when they decide they don't want to be a slave it's not like i've you know i mean it's different in a voluntary agreement because if i volunteer myself to be a quote-unquote slave and then i change my mind well i made the decision and i changed my mind but if i'm forced if someone forces me to be a slave there's no changing of the mind i never wanted to be a slave in the first place so it's not like i'm going to a court and say i no longer want to be a slave i never wanted to be a slave but i was forced into it and the fact that i live in a society that accepts that as legitimate in my view how can that be an anarchist society i'm being ruled over and society at large isn't viewing that as a crime against me it's just viewing it as me being someone's property you know what i mean it's that that's the kind of stickling part for me i kind of it's uh, not it's not all of society it's it's whatever the legal system is that's justifying that um, action and there can be another legal system that's right along that side that legal system that could um, step in and say okay this was not a legitimate process that you're um, we're not going to treat this as a, a fair thing yeah but my point is is that the legal system like I say, if we had a legal system that allowed for a communist dictatorship, we would then we would then throw our book down and say this is no longer anarcho-capitalism. So no, no. Now look, I, this is the point though that it, you can have a legal system that says, okay, yes, communist dictatorship, let's do that. But um, I think even that can exist in an anarcho-capitalistic context. It's just that. Um, you have a competing legal system there too something that says okay this isn't allowed and you know the co consumer say is free to choose that other legal system that's the thing that makes it anarcho-capitalism so just just so i'm understanding you properly so the ability to become a communist dictatorship is allowed in an anarcho capitalist system but once yes. it became a communist dictatorship <laughs> it would then no longer be an anarcho capitalist would that be correct or would it still be an anarcho capitalist because of how it got there it depends on exactly how you define you know communist dictatorship but well, yeah, it would stop being an anarcho capitalist at a certain point for sure. Yeah, I mean, I did choose that because it, <laughs> that view that seemed to me to be the most unambiguously opposite to an anarcho capitalism. You know, I was trying to think right. of something that's that's most definitely not anarcho capitalism. I'm thinking, okay, well, let's go communism to be the opposite to the capitalism and and dictatorship to be the opposite to the anarcho. For me, the absolute opposite would be that. I mean, even more so than fascism. You know what I mean? So. I mean, I always say fascism is the opposite to voluntarism, but anarcho-capitalism would be the opposite to a, um, a communist dictatorship. My point is, is because I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm trying to nail down a definition of anarcho-capitalism that that you and David are working from, 
so that I can say this is the anarcho-capitalism and this is not anarcho-capitalism. And the problem is, it seems like I can't find anything to put in the this is not anarcho-capitalism box. It seems well, like- Well, that's why I'm saying it's choice. It's, it's the market, it's the free market is choice. It's the laissez-faire, don't, you know, don't restrict any possibility, right? But the problem is he's saying don't restrict any possibility and really meaning without any restrictions any possibility then have a government again is one of the possibilities it is one of the possibilities so my point is is okay well I'll, if, if we accept that anarcho-capitalism allows for all of these things including things that aren't anarcho-capitalism a system that allows for that can still be called anarcho-capitalism but once it becomes one of these possibilities depending on what the possibility is, it mm -hmm. might not be anarcho-capitalism anymore. Like, like, like my, my point is, is I'm fully happy to accept the, the idea that anarcho-capitalism has all these possible things that it could become, including a communist dictatorship. But my point is, is once it actually does that transition, it may have been anarcho-capitalism before to, to make the journey, but once it's made the journey and it's reached the destination of being and our, um, of communist dictatorship, then we can say, this is no longer anarcho-capitalism. And everything that's now happening is you know, in violation of what anarcho-capitalism is, even if how we got there wasn't. Right, so I, I would like to actually put, uh, bring in sort of the analogy of democracy to this, because that's really what I think anarcho-capitalism is the alternative to. Um, and it's funny um, because, you know, a lot of people say, okay, Trump right now is dangerous for democracy because, you know, he might actually like declare himself dictator and, you know, forego the, uh, you know, throw out the votes and say it was all voter fraud or something like that. Um, but like, yeah, that's, that's something that democracy can do. It can create um, situations where you stop having democracy anymore. You know, when you examine the process, not from like the philosophical lens, where we say, oh, democracy means everyone's equal, we all get a, you know, same right to vote and all this sort of things. And when you start examining it from the economic perspective, that's when you say, okay, actually democracy allows for a whole lot more than what these idealists think it should allow for like you know dictatorship and despotism and oligarchy and you know the, the whole thing um that the uh athenian said was like you know uh democracy you know their system in athens like transitioned between um, oligarchy, dictatorship, and anarchy uh, before returning to democracy again, you know? Yeah, I, I, I get your analogy, and I understand the point you're making. And, and, and to be honest, that's a good analogy to use democracy, because as you say, you can have a democratic system where people within that democratic system vote for something that's not a democratic system, like we want... <laughs> So I get what you're saying, and, 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 and using the same kind of line of thinking, you're saying, okay, well, we can have an anarcho-capitalist system, and through that kind of, it's not voting, but that kind of voting mechanism, so to speak, of, of, of you know, of, of, of capitalism and, and running through that model could get you to this other place. But my point is, is like, to use your democracy analogy, we could have democracy, and in that democratic system, people could then choose through that democratic process to have a different system that's no longer democracy. My point is, is with the anarcho-capitalism thing, are we saying the same thing? We're saying, okay, anarcho-capitalism allows for many possibilities, including things that would no longer be anarcho-capitalism. Would that be accurate? Yeah, yeah. And it's just the thing that makes it superior to democracy is that economically it favours better outcomes than democracy does. Democracy favours 
it not, doesn't just allow for like dictatorship and oligarchy. It really does like lend itself towards those things actually. Whereas a market it lends itself towards the things that people actually desire. It's more, you know, democratic in quotation marks in that sense. Yeah, I mean, I find that more credible within the paradigm of voluntarism. I, I mean, I suppose that's why I've had this pushback with the idea of allowing coercion in an ANCAP society, because, like I say, a lot of the arguments about, because all of the ways in which democracy and to well, all forms of government lend themselves to more oppressive forms of government. So, but the reason for that is because of that coercion that exists. So if you have a coercive system that's democratically controlled, because you have that coercive system, that democratically controlled uh, system of coercion could degrade into like a dictatorship or something that's no longer a democracy. My point is, is if you have an anarcho-capitalist society that also allows for coercion, then for, like, for me, the big selling point of anarcho-capitalism is the lack of coercion, is removing government and all equivalent kind of organisations that would, you know, violate our, you know, uh, to have a truly free market where we are operating as free individuals and exercising our property rights and all of that sort of stuff, that requires an absence of coercion in my view. So, like... I suppose one of the reasons why I pushed so hard on this whole coercion thing and whether it would be allowed is I do worry about anarcho-capitalism being more likely to devolve into these other things if the coercion is already allowed from the starting point. Um, and my other, my other concern about it is if, you, if you've got that coercion, like it's, it's the coercion, it's like, I mean, I said to... Um, when, when I was talking to David, I said something about, oh, well, what if you had an organization that started doing this, that, and the other, like coercing? I can't remember the exact example I gave. But his response to that was, oh, well, they'll have less customers. I'm like, yeah, but that only matters in a truly voluntary system. If you're allowing coercion, then the whole needing to keep your customers thing doesn't matter so much because you can use coercion. You know, like the reason why our government doesn't give us a good value for our product is because we don't have a choice on whether we're using the services and we, they, you know, and they, they fund it through the, the theft of taxation and all the rest of it. My point is, is the whole reason why anarcho-capitalism is a superior alternative to our status model is because we're removing the coercion. And my point is, is if we don't remove the coercion and allow it to exist, even if it's only in a decentralized form, we lose so many of the things that make anarcho-capitalism appealing. Well, um, I, I'm going to just sort of accept sort of that framework of it, because I think, you know, we've sort of talked our way into circles around that. But um, I want to go back to the point that like anarcho-capitalism is this, um, you know, means and not an ends within itself. So to me, that means that like, um, you know, it is the superior system to today's system, right? We can at least agree on that, right? That you're not going to like it's it might be that like coercion is technically allowed and you know rulers government that's all technically allowed but by its starting point it's not like there in the way that coercion is fundamentally a part of this system that we have today um I'm reluctant to agree to that, to be honest, because I mean, I think it's partly because I'm, I'm still not the, the, the coercion that can exist in a narco capitalist and capitalist system is still not fully defined for me. So I'm not happy to say that. And I mean, like I say, I'm, I'm happy to say anarcho capitalism is better than what we've got now under my definition of what anarcho capitalism is by defining it as some form of voluntarism. But a, a, a version of anarcho capitalism that allows coercion now when you ask me the question oh well that's surely better than what we've got now I'm like well i'm not so sure because it's still got what's fundamentally wrong with what like my problem with what we've got now 
is the coercion, is the violation of rights. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's other aspects of it. And I can understand that even in a, like, even in a free society, even in a truly voluntary society, people, I know many ANCAPs will say, look, I don't want socialism, even if it's a voluntary version, you know, so there's still conversations to be had over what's better in both a coercive system and in a voluntary system. But my point is, is my fundamental problem with the government isn't that they provide free healthcare or that they build roads or they do any of these things is that they rob me to do it and that they claim a right over me to you know rob me and do whatever else they want whether it's infringe on my right to do this or infringe on my right to do that so so that's my objection so if 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 if, if someone's going to offer me another system that still has the coercion I'm like, well, you're not selling it to me because the whole, for me, the biggest selling point about anarcho-capitalism, not the only selling point, there are other aspects that you mentioned about, you know, the, the market and what have you, but the, the main selling point for anarcho-capitalism is the anarcho part. I mean, I don't really view myself as a capitalist. One of the reasons why I go on this voluntarism thing is because I'm trying to present it as a kind of neutral, I just want a free society. I don't care if people live in communes. I don't care if people have laissez-faire capitalism, as long as my rights and everyone's rights are respected. And that's kind of my thing. If you say, well, here, let's do this capitalist model where we won't have a centralized ruling authority, but we might still have coercion in decentralized ways. I'm like, well, maybe that'll be better maybe it'll be worse for some people it might be better for some people it might be worse if you're one of the people who used to live in a country let's say i mean imagine you lived in a country that currently doesn't have particularly harsh drug laws and then you have your anarcho-capitalist revolution but you happen to live near a bunch of people that decide they want to enforce drug laws all of a sudden your situation's a hell of a lot worse than it was under the government so my my point is is i'm not and this is just my own personal feeling, and you may differ on this, but I'm not prepared to swap one form of coercion for another. I want to swap coercion for freedom. And I know that's a little bit like going straight to the ends and not worrying about the means, but because David made a similar point with regards to sort of saying, look, cap anarcho-capitalism is my road to voluntarism, and you just want to go straight to voluntarism. But my point, my counterpoint to that point, because it's a fair point, but my counterpoint to that point is you still got to get to either one. Like if you say, let's start a voluntarism or let's start an anarcho-capitalism, either way, the effort required is somewhat similar. And I would actually argue that with regards to appealing to people, certainly from my own personal experience, I think voluntarism is an easier sell than anarcho-capitalism because anybody that's of a left-wing persuasion has an immediate distaste for the word capitalism they don't like it they they have an objection to that i've spoken to a lot of people that describe themselves as voluntarists and socialists and what have you who have agreed to become voluntarists who've understood the concept of self-ownership and non-aggression principle and they're on board with that but they won't call themselves capitalists not in a million years will they call themselves capitalists because they're still anti that so for me, when I'm having a conversation with someone, if I'm talking to a right winger, then yeah, I could probably convince him to anarcho capitalism. I could convince him into state capitalism. I can convince him into any kind of capitalism because he's already won over on the capitalism side of it. And the other things are, uh, you know, are, are neither, maybe neither here nor there for them. But if I'm talking to a left winger, they're not interested in capitalism, but they might, not all of them, because some of them are obviously hypocrites and what have you, but some of them, and certainly many that I've spoken to, as I say, I've spoken to progressives who now call themselves progressive voluntarists. I've spoken to people who now call themselves voluntary socialists. As far It might sound oxymoronic, but as far as they're concerned, they're voluntarists and they understand and respect self-ownership, property rights, and the non-aggression principle. I'm much rather... Uh, I think I think I've got much more chance of convincing more people to come under that banner where they don't have to dedicate themselves to an economic preference in either direction. Like I'm not trying to convert capitalists into socialists or socialists into capitalists. I'm just trying to convert statists into voluntarists and I, and let them keep their you know some might convert you know because once you've got that once you've got that foundation of voluntarism, having an economic conversation is a lot easier. People become more open because you haven't got the threat of coercion attached to whatever economic system you're trying to sell to them. And they can say, oh, well, I don't agree with that, but good luck to you. You know, I, I mean, I was um, talking about one of these kind of voluntary socialism models to an ANCAP. And as I was talking to him about it, he was saying, well, 
yeah, I don't want it. I wouldn't want any part of that because I think socialism doesn't work. Even without the coercion, it wouldn't work. And that's fair enough. But what he also said was, look, good luck to anyone who wants to try it. I've got no problem with them trying it. I mean, this is a point that ANCOMs often make to, I'm oh, sorry, that ANCAPs often make to ANCOMs. They often say, look, we allow your society, but you won't allow ours. And that's the kind of, for me, that's the selling point of anarcho-capitalism is the voluntarist aspect. It's the fact that everyone's free to live how they want as long as they let other people have that same freedom. And for me, and an incarnation of anarcho-capitalism that doesn't have those features and does allow for coercion, it becomes inconsistent. It becomes arbitrary in many ways, certainly from a moral point of view. I know David's not necessarily coming at it from the moral point of view. He's, he's dealing with the practicalities. How do we, what's going to get us there and what's the way that, you know, and I, I do understand those arguments. And to be honest, if he was working within the framework of voluntarism, if, like I would be on board with what David Friedman is advocating if he was accepting it within the paradigm of the non-aggression principle. But because he's happy to step outside of that, I'm not happy to go with him, you know, because... For me, it's about voluntarism. So I understand we're coming at it from slightly different angles, but that's my kind of point about, I actually, like, like when you said about the circles, where you think the anarcho-capitalism circle is bigger than the voluntary circle. That's why I asked about what you meant about the size of that circle. Because if you're talking about the appeal, the wideness of the appeal, I think you're wrong. I think voluntarism is the bigger circle. I think I can get more people on the voluntarism board because I can get people on the left and the right wing to jump on the voluntarism train, but I could only get right-wingers on the anarcho-capitalism train. Okay, let, let me try and like reframe some, something just to bring it away from this whole like uh, semantic ickiness about capitalism. <laughs> um, because I really want, I would consider myself like a platformist. You know, I, I'm very much like you, um, I want the alliance of all the various anarchists and even the various minarchists to like, like really push for um, smaller government and the elim elimination of government. You know, um, I I would say that um, I am fully comfortable with the idea that we would establish anarchy rather than specifically anarcho-capitalism um, because well frankly like as i said earlier like it would be anarcho-capitalism anyway <laughs> well yeah yeah right because like david friedman as his whole thing is like um the way he's approaching this is he was looking at anarchy and the actual economic implications of anarchy and those are separate from whatever idealistic notions people have about it right so even when we get to this place of anarchy i think it instantly becomes market anarchy not just because you know capitalism is superior or whatever, but in fact, because people are left to their own device, not to their own devices, but to their own like um, decision-making power and their own willpower to um, make choices and um, there will be different options available to them at that point. So at, at that moment, when we get rid of government, when we get rid of the main coercive body, and we get rid of like um, monopolistic coercive bodies that instantly um, just brings about choices for people that people didn't have before. That brings about a system where um, people can explore, you know, their different ideologies, they can put different things into practice. Some people can go um, reform a state, some people can go form a communistic society, and some people can form a voluntarist society. And that's why, like, when I talk about market anarchism, and 
you know, described uh, anarcho-capitalism as that. I, I really am trying to describe like anarchy in general. And, I, um, and so to go to like uh, my hourglass analogy, like that's whatever is in that um, narrow point of the hourglass where all these ideologies kind of converge, um, that's the system that I think is, uh, you know, the one that makes the most sense to like work towards. And that's the system of just getting rid of the state period. And that's, that's where like everyone who considers themselves an anarchist is obviously on board with. Not everyone who considers themselves an anarchist is on board with the specific um, moral requirements of the NAP. But not everyone who considers themselves anarchist is down with capitalism either. I mean, many anarchists view them. But they don't have to be. They don't have to be. So when, when we get anarchism, right, that's all I'm asking for. And then, you know, I think what naturally happens there is capitalism, but that's the difference of like expectation, right? Um, I think, you know, I'm willing to describe that system as being a market. And I think people are just hung up on that, those terms. Um, but, you know, really, we're saying the same thing. Yeah, but I mean, I don't actually disagree with that. I mean, I, I like the, the idea that, I mean, I said it myself, that, that capitalism is kind of the default economic system for anarchism. If you have true anarchism, then without making any kind of special plans to build a commune or anything like that, your default economy will be capitalism. Because if you're all, if there's, you know, that all you've got is yourself and you're trading with other people and what have you, you know, like I say, you can get together to form other things, but the default would be capitalism. So I do agree with your assertion that if you create an anarchist society, then capitalism and, you know, anarcho capitalism as we define it would be the kind of default you know, econo economy that would come from that. Um, but I agree with that, with my definition of anarchism, meaning no rulers at all, not just no centralized one that has a monopoly on four. I mean, I suppose, and um, like I said, we don't want to go around in circles forever on, on, on the same thing, but I suppose if I was to pinpoint, like, because like, I don't expect us to convince each other, I mean, the conversation's more about understanding each other more, we can still disagree, but if we understand what each other are saying, I think that's, you know, progress, you know, in, in itself and what makes it worthwhile. And for me, and correct me if you think I've got this wrong, but it seems to me that the fundamental, the fundamental difference between us isn't what you said, because I agree with that. I agree that capitalism would be the default for an anarchist society. But my point is, is I agree with that under my definition of anarchism that means no rulers of any kind and then i agree with that but when you allow coercion when you allow rulers doesn't just have to be a monopolistic centralized one that we would call government any kind of ruling authorities or coercive agents then you don't have a free market then you don't have anarchism as i would describe it and then capitalism doesn't become the natural default it becomes the natural default in a real anarchist society where you don't have that coercion because when you don't have that coercion and everyone's free individuals then voluntary trade i mean it almost it almost rolls off the tongue as the obvious next step if we have a voluntary society where all interactions are voluntary then voluntary trade sounds an obvious way to conduct business but my problem is, is if you have a society that's not a voluntary society where coercion is allowed, that the only thing that separates it from what we have now is that the ruling authorities are dispersed and decentralized and no one has monopoly, you know, on the use of force. They're like competing monopolies or, or, or competing ruling entities or whatever. In that situation, then it lends itself to things like dictatorships communist or, or otherwise and that's and I suppose like to use your hourglass analogy the reason why I see 
voluntarism as the road to take us to where we want to be, even though it is kind of where we want to be as well. So I know that sounds like oh, I'm starting with the ends and calling it the means, but it's not necessarily because we want more than just that. You know, like, like I say, I want a voluntary society, but an ANCAP who wants a voluntary society wants an ANCAP voluntary society, whereas my progressive voluntarist friends wants a progressive society, how he would define it, still within that voluntarist framework. So I don't view anarcho-capitalism as being the road to where we all want to go because as you yourself admitted it's not necessarily the road to there it, it you might think it's likely to take us there but it might also take us to all these other horrible places you know voluntarism is only taking us to forms of voluntarism anarcho-capitalism if it can include coercive versions can take us to coercive places whereas a society that is defined by its non-coercive nature can't take us anywhere else i mean that's not to say it couldn't change into another society and you know anything can happen you know like any you know you could have a free society and it could be tum um it could be toppled and taken over by a dictatorship but my point is is it wouldn't be the it wouldn't be voluntarism anymore my problem with anarcho-capitalism is you have a you can have a society where you've got that coercion you've got these ruling authorities and we're still calling it anarcho-capitalism and if if that qualifies as anarcho-capitalism then the anarcho-capitalism the the roads that anarcho-capitalism can lead us might include free society but it also includes oppressive and fascist societies as well and i think that would cause a big obstacle when it comes to trying to like when it, we're talking about the size of the circle i think if, if something like that would drastically reduce the size of the circle that anarcho-capitalism is going to appeal to because all of the people that want a voluntary society are going to be i mean i certainly am i'm i'm a voluntarist and i'm down with anarcho-capitalism until i come across this incarnation that allows for coercion and then i'm all of a sudden i'm not down with that no more you know what i mean so okay but that's one one incarnation the the point is that it's broad enough to encompass like all these very, very different incarnations. Um, and to that end, it seems like your definition of anarchy is a smaller circle than my definition of ANCAP. What do you mean by smaller circle? Like it's, it's a, like your definition of, you know, anarchy being like, um, this place with no rulers. And then you're saying that like ANCAP means there could be rulers, right? Um, that means that um, anarcho-capitalism would precede uh, anarchy in like the order of going from state statist society towards voluntarist society. If you're going on that trajectory, then yes. But the problem is, is that's only one of many possible roads it could take you. Like, like my point is, is if we use voluntarism as the means and a, a specific type of voluntary society as the end. So let's say you want a specific type of voluntary society. You want an ANCAP one because that's the one you view as working best in, a, you know, and all the rest of it. My point is, is a, a voluntary society, assuming you're staying faithful to that, you know, there's no guarantee that it won't, you know, that it will work, but assuming that it's always going to be a voluntary society and go on that trajectory, it's only going to take you to voluntary society because it's not allowing for anything else. Now, there's different types of voluntary societies that it can take you to. It can take you to, a, like I say, one that's more communistic-like, one that's more capitalistic-like, but they're always going to be free societies. The problem is with this capitalist model that can go in a free society, but it could also go to a coercive one, is, well, it'd be great if it goes to the free society, but if it goes to the coercive one, then we're in a, you know, we're in a fascist nightmare. And although... I'm not saying that that can't, you know, if we have a, I'm not saying that a voluntary society can't turn into a fascist society. I'm just saying that if it did, it would have to actually change to do that. It would have to violate itself. It would have to no longer be a voluntary society to even start that journey. Whereas, unfortunately, the anarcho-capitalist society can take you almost all the way to a communist dictatorship. And it's only the last tiny little part of a communist dictatorship that means it's no longer an ANCAP society, you know? So it feels like 
the journey to a coercive society seems more realistic because anarcho-capitalism will actually take you closer to it. You know, as soon as you as soon as you step into any kind of coercion, you're no longer in a voluntary society. And that used to be how I viewed anarcho-capitalism. But if we say, no, anarcho-capitalism, you can have slavery, you can have drug laws, you can have decentralized ruling authorities. It's only when you have one big government that has a monopoly over all others that you can't escape from. Only then will we say you're no longer in an ANCAP society. By that point, it's too late. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's kind of like, I just it just seems to me... And like I said, I don't want to go around in circles and labour the same point over and over, but my fundamental problem with it is the, the virtues of anarcho-capitalism are lost when we allow coercion into the equation. Um, okay, can you define for me what your definition of capitalism is? Like that might be very interesting. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think it's really the sticking point because we're more focusing on the anarcho part. But I mean, capitalism, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I know it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but I just go by the dictionary definition of private ownership with voluntary trade almost as, as implied from that. But capitalism just means private ownership to me. And then the voluntary trade is obviously implicit. If you've got private ownership, then obviously you can trade it. Okay, because to me like voluntarism is in some sense more capitalist than what I'm calling ANCAP is. Because like what you were saying earlier about how, you know, you can sort of sell yourself into this form of slavery or the pseudo slavery um, under voluntarism, like that's a, something that, uh, an ANCOM would certainly have particular issue with. Um, that I think if you're saying that um, it, co contracts are like fundamentally uh, legitimate and that like <laughs> private, what? Private ownership can, extend towards um, kind of having right to someone else's labor, right to someone else's uh, time if they agree to it ahead of time or something like that, um, then like that's pretty darn capitalistic. And I don't think that, uh, I, th I think that's something that if, people on the left really understood that part of um, voluntarism, they might not agree that it's very voluntary, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. I mean, I'm of the opinion that for the most part, ANCOMs are not anarchists, despite them claiming to be, precisely for the reason why I'm saying that this particular version of anarcho-capitalism isn't anarchist. Now, maybe I'm being too absolutist with my definitions, but I'm, I'm, I, I feel like I'm not pushing beyond the pale by saying that anarchism must mean no rulers. And by my definition of that, an, ANCAP is only failing under the, these incarnations that you're talking about that allow for coercion. But ANCOMs have always advocated for coercion. They want to seize means of production. They don't want to allow people to own factories and stuff like that. If there's any ANCOMs listening that feel I'm misrepresenting you, then please tell me that you're different. But I've spoken to enough ANCOMs who do believe this to feel like I'm not strawmanning them by saying this. ANCOMs advocate for so many things that, again, qualify as ruling. It's telling me that I, like, like I mean, I've had ANCOMs say that employment shouldn't be allowed because it's hierarchy, um, that ownership of a factory shouldn't be allowed because it's means of production, no matter how you acquired it. 
um, you know, house ownership is contingent on you living there. Like if you turned it into a factory, all of a sudden it's not yours anymore and all of this sort of stuff. All of these rules imposed on people are violating their property rights, violating their self ownership and is essentially ruling them. So ANCOMs might want to call themselves anarchists, but for me, they're just communists. I don't see how they're any different from, you know, state communists other than the fact that they want decentralized coercion rather than centralized coercion and this is exactly the problem i have with this specific version of anarcho-capitalism like before i came across this this kind of idea that anarcho-capitalism could have coercion when it used to be in my mind a version of voluntarism i was always on the ancap side of the ancap ancom debate because ancoms were always advocating for something that violated anarchism in my view like you know like you know coercion ruling people seizing production all that sort of not allowing people to be employed all that's that's ruling people that's claiming a right to tell them what they can do you know so for me that's not anarchist the problem is is if anarcho-capitalism starts allowing this stuff then i'm like well that's not anarchist either but you know in accordance to my um definition of anarchism and like i say by defining anarchism as simply meaning no rulers i don't think that's a controversial definition you know i know um, you're talking about more like a monopoly and, and all of that, but I don't really, I mean, and again, this is, we should probably acknowledge that we have slightly different definitions of anarchism here because yours is requiring a, an actual monopoly on, on um, ruling over people, whereas mine's not. So. Not exactly. Okay, okay. Because my definition is still like, there are no rulers, but it, it means no rulers in a physical, um, you know, elimination of choice sense, and not just in its like ideology. So the the thing that makes monopoly the um, this big defining quality is that that is the thing that um, stops there from being choice that creates the situation in which people no longer have the choice to not be ruled by someone. It also depends how what you're talking about with regards to choice as well, isn't it? Because, I mean, I've had plenty of conversations with ANCOMs who want to talk about employment being coercive because so many people are choosing in one respect, but not choosing in another because, I mean, like, you know, I have a job, that doesn't pay me anywhere near the wages that I want. And I hate the job and I work more hours than I want and all of these things. So, I mean, but it, I did choose it. I chose it because I have don't have other options and I don't have better options and I got a family to feed and all of these things. So these are the things that compromise my choice. But in the sense of self-ownership and voluntarism, we acknowledge that that's still voluntary because no other person is coercing us. There's no one's ruling over us in that sense. Like, because people often, when we talk about governments ruling us, one of the favorite things that the commies say is, well, your employer rules you. Is that whenever he doesn't, I agree for him to act like he rules me or be my, I mean, this is the difference between rulers and leaders. I mean, you know, like you choose a leader, rulers rule you against your will. And like, you know, I, I you know, it's a voluntary hierarchy. I, I agree for my employer to be my boss and to, and to submit to this hierarchy for the 12 hours that I'm working my shift. I've made that agreement. So that's not ruling me. Ruling me is when it's not my agreement, when it's, you know, when someone else is claiming authority over me. The fact that I have authority over myself is what allows me to enter into the agreements, employment agreements, and in the more extreme cases of like what we were talking about, like voluntary slavery or, you know, or killing yourself or whatever, you know, like I say, you own you, so you do what you want with yourself. That includes submitting to any hierarchy that you choose to, but those hierarchies aren't ruling you because you chose to submit to them. Whereas an authority that's doing it against your will, so this is my point about the communes that want to come and take my house or want to tell me that I'm not allowed to work for somebody or want to tell me I can't own a factory, they're all attempting to rule over me in the same way that a government would. They're not a government because they're not centralised. They don't have a monopoly on force. But the, 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 the coercion and the right over me that they're claiming and acting upon is still there. And 
whether or not I can escape that isn't dependent on whether it's a centralized authority or not. As I say, it might be easier for me to escape a centralized authority that has a monopoly and is the, and, and qualifies as a government with all the trappings of a government, it might be easier for me to escape that than it is for a, a smaller, more decentralized ruling authority, depending on my circumstances. You know, it's like like the people, for example, that are ruled by a mafia, you know, that might be a smaller organization than a centralized government. And perhaps they're competing with other mafia families and they're in a smaller area or whatever, you know, whatever the situation is. But the, 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 the coercion is still there. There's still somebody else claiming right and authority over you which is in violation of your right over yourself i mean one of the things that this conversation's kind of alluded to and i did mention at the beginning is this is kind of why i prefer voluntarism to anarchism because voluntarism is so much more explicit about you know what it's about whereas anarchism although i think a lot of this stuff is implicit it's not as explicitly said which is why you know we have these differences of definitions that we do you know it would be very uh, it's much less likely that we would differ over our definition of voluntarism than we are over our definition of anarchism i would imagine because voluntarism is more explicit with regards to what it's about everything must be voluntary whereas anarchism i still think that's implied in anarchism from the no rulers mantra but it's not as explicit because it's just saying no rulers and then you say well is this really ruling me is that really ruling me if he punches me in the face is that really ruling me whereas obviously with voluntarism self-ownership that violation is always clear so there is there is that aspect but i do think it comes down to the fact that we are fundamentally it's only a slight difference but it's enough to cause the problem we have this slight difference in how we define anarchism and i define it in quite an absolute sense of meaning no rulers that's why in my view ancoms are not anarchists and that is also in my view why anarcho-capitalism as you and david are defining it isn't anarchist either because for me anarchism means no rulers and if you have rulers that are accepted as legitimate as part of the definition not you know then for me that's not anarchist like I say, that doesn't, you know, like I say, it, it's not the same as having someone commit these crimes in secret. It's about saying this is legitimate. It's about, you know, the fact that drug laws can legitimately exist as part of anarcho-capitalism. Well, rape can't, theft can't. So why can drug laws? Why can enslavement? I don't, it's, for me, if you remove the coercion of a ruling authority, then you should be removing the right to do all of those things. Um, yeah, I mean, but that it just goes back to the point of like anarcho-capitalism being the broader thing, or you know what I'm calling anarcho-capitalism. Like, sorry, go on. Like the fact that you know it it is the system where you go in order to choose whatever the next system you want there to be. Okay, so like when you create an anarchist society, it becomes a you know market anarchist society, I would say. Um, it, and that implies nothing about like the monetary order or the legal order or whatever. It's just saying, you know, you suddenly have the choice as to what direction you want to go in. That's, to me, the central appeal to um, market anarchism or anarcho-capitalism. And then- But what if you're a slave? What? But, sorry, but what if you're a slave? Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> it depends on what, what, uh, uh, level of like acceptance of slavery there is if it's the only legal order in place is the one that accepts slavery then I would say that that is a way in which the system is not as anarcho-capitalistic if that it's one legal order that accepts slavery and then there's this legal order over here that does not accept slavery but slavery still persists um, 
you know, that I think would be more like what I'm saying anarcho-capitalism is. But when you said that slavery would make it less anarcho-capitalism, so- If, if the like uh, prevailing legal order, the legal order that um, has in a sense of uh, monopolistic power, that if that is tolerant towards the institution of slavery, then um, it's less anarcho-capitalistic, but that's not because of the slavery part, that's because of the monopoly part. Okay, but if we remove the monopoly part of it, because I, I mean, I fully accept what you're saying that, I mean, like, for example, we're, we're on the same page when it comes to both agreeing that a monopolistic ruling authority wouldn't be anarchist. Like, we, we're both agreeing on that. But where, mm -hmm. we, where we disagree, is like I go beyond that and I say any ruling authority not just a monopolistic one not just a centralized one but any ruling authority is violation of anarchism uh, whereas you seem to be saying only a monopolistic centralized one is like you know disqualifying disqualifying it from as being anarchism so I mean just just correct me if I'm wrong it, would, would you agree that that's our fundamental difference with anarchism like your version of anarchism is no centralized ruling authority with a monopoly whereas my definition of anarchism is no rulers at all would you say that's a fair characterization of where we differ well I, I think our disagreement is more on the definition of rulers because I think that's someone that's using coercion in to do something that um, you know we consider criminal just on its own is not a ruling authority i agree i agree okay uh, but so the, the the thing about anarcho-capitalism is that um there isn't some you know, it's not associated with any legal order. It's, it's right. The legal order is put on the market. So, um, uh, well, where were we? We were, but just, about... but just to go what you said about, um, oh, sorry, I've lost it myself now. <laughs> um, where you said that anarchism, Oh, I have lost, I've lost it. I don't know why I've lost that. I had it in, on my head. And Anarchism is the <laughs> lack of ruling authority. Right. Okay. Okay. So uh, a plantation in a broader society that does not have any specific um, legal order that has competing legal orders, I... I don't think that that slavery plantation is itself, uh, you know, a ruling authority. I think that it needs the um, coercive power of some, you know, uh, acknowledged legal system or you know, specifically like the rights protection, right protection agencies that David Friedman talks about, if those sorts of institutions come out and defend the institution of slavery, that makes it a ruling authority. Okay, well, that's kind of where I'm coming from then, because I do agree with your point that not like, for example, ruling ruling people is a violation of the non-aggression principle but not all violations of the non-aggression principle qualifies ruling people you know if i rape someone that doesn't mean i'm ruling them if i murder them it doesn't mean i'm ruling them so you could argue that if i use force to stop you taking a drug that's not necessarily ruling you because like we could view that as me just assaulting you, you know, and, 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 and preventing you from taking a drug and doing, you know, whatever. And we could just treat it as a crime. But my problem is, is if an anarcho-capitalist society viewed the enforcement of drug laws the same as they would view any other violation of the non-aggression principle as a crime, 
as something that is illegitimate. So rather than saying, oh, this person's enforcing drug laws, they would say, no, what this person is doing is assaulting and kidnapping people for, you know, because he doesn't like what drugs they're taking. My point is, is if we characterize it as drug laws, we're not saying that this guy is going around assaulting and kidnapping people. We're saying he's enforcing drug laws. He's saying we're saying that he is exercising an authority over other people to tell them what they put in their body. So while I do agree that not all violations of the non-aggression principle qualifies ruling people, enforcing drug laws certainly would be in my mind because of the claim of authority you know like like what i'm saying is is if i say you're not allowed to smoke weed and i'm going to use force to stop you what i'm saying is is if we if if, if i'm saying that's as a law i'm saying you're not allowed to right then i'm that i'm exert i'm exerting some kind of authority over you and if society accepts that then I don't view that as an anarchist society because they're accepting my rule over you, which is illegitimate because I don't have a rule over you. Now, if I do the exact same action, I use force to stop you taking drugs, but society doesn't characterise that as me enforcing a drug law, but rather me just committing an act of aggression against you, which is what it really is in reality, in, you know, according, certainly according to my moral framework, then, then it can call it... Because you know, my point is, because one of the things that David said to me was that, you know, you can call something whatever you want. That's not a magic wand to, you know, to make it stay that way. I totally take that point. I'm not saying that crimes can't exist. I'm not saying slavery can't exist in anarcho-capitalist systems or that someone enforcing, you know, the equivalent to a drug door can't happen in anarcho-capitalist society. I'm saying that those things would be crimes they wouldn't be enforcing drug laws they, like me claiming ownership over someone as my slave i don't own them but they're not my slave i don't have that right so what i've actually done is just kidnap somebody and threaten them and, and all the all of the actual criminal acts that you would associate with it so that's the kind of point i'm making with it i i fully accept that just as much as in my voluntary society that i want someone might still rape somebody but it's not it's not something that's due legitimate. You know, we, we view it as rape. We view it as a crime. If I take your house, we view that as theft. We view it as a crime. But if we lived in a communist dictatorship, we might view that as legitimate. I'm just seizing the means of production. In a, you know what I mean? So that's my point. An anarcho-capitalist society that views drug laws as legitimate is incoherent and contradicting and, and all the things that I'm saying about it. Not because it's allowing it to happen in the sense of it's not actively stopping it or whatever. That's not what it's about. I'm saying, you know, like I say, rapes could occur. That doesn't. But what we're saying is, is rape is not a legitimate part of anarcho-capitalism, even if it could still occur in that society. My point is, is drug, the, using the same kind of uh, line of thought, I'm saying drug laws are not a legitimate part of anarcho-capitalist society. And anyone that tries to enforce something like that it's just committing a crime. They're not, you know, they don't actually have that authority. And if we as a society say that he does have that authority and recognise what he's doing as legitimate, then, like I say, that's when, that's when the definition of an anarcho-capitalist falls apart for me. It's not the existence of the crime, it's the legitimization of it on a societal level, if that makes, I hope that makes sense. Okay, but so the thing is that your the voluntary society that you want is a subset of the greater number of possibilities that could occur in an anarcho-capitalist society. Yeah. Okay, so I guess the thing is, like, what is most likely to happen first i would also uh, say vice versa like anarcho-capitalism is one of the possible consequences of a voluntary society just as a voluntary society is one of the possible consequences of an anarcho-capitalist society uh-huh well yeah i mean in a certain sense i think that's the the um it's, 
I mean, this is where it gets different between like talking about this philosophically versus economically, okay? Because I think that anarcho-capitalism is a subset of the possibilities that can happen within um, anarcho-communist society because, you know, they want to do anarcho-communism, but it might be that the allocation of resources doesn't work that well in anarcho-communism, and it might be more advantageous for people to choose these market-based institutions that David Friedman talks about. But in that case, that wouldn't, wouldn't be so much anarcho-communism bringing us anarcho-capitalism in the sense of it, you know, it facilitating it, but more it being a case of anarcho-communism anarcho failing so miserably that we abandon it for anarcho-capitalism. I know that might seem like a, a distinction without a difference, but the reason why I feel that's still valid is because, like, you know, any system you could, if it fails, you could abandon it and go for a totally different system because you've abandoned that system because it failed. But that's not the same as this system, if it works, would lead you to that. You know, like, like we're saying that if an anarcho-capitalist system worked well, it might give us a voluntary society. But if an anarcho-communist society worked well, it wouldn't give us an ANCAP society. It would only give us an ANCAP society if it fails miserably and people realise it's not the way to go, so they go a different way. Whereas if we have a voluntary society, that could actually give us an ANCAP society as part of, and vice versa. An ANCAP society could actually give us a voluntary society through it working well. Whereas a communist society is only going to give us a capitalist society through it failing miserably and us abandoning it and going to an alternative. Uh huh. Well, I think, um, like in the realm of possibility for today's society, and maybe we can uh, transfer over to talking about like the nations of sanity stuff, but like, um, like in today's society, I don't think if it fails, we necessarily get like we don't get voluntarism, we don't get anarcho-communism, and we don't get anarcho-capitalism. What we get when today's society fails is a lot more of the same and a lot more of like really bad coercion stuff. And I think that when this society is successful, then we also get coercion and uh, lots of uh, worse outcomes. So my point in bringing that up is to say that anarcho-capitalism is not unique in its allowance for coercive things. It is unique in its allowance for anarchistic things. And today's society is uh, not structured economically in such a way that we are very likely to get um, voluntarist things or any other kind of anarchistic things out of it. So when I go to my hourglass analogy and say that there's this point of convergence where everyone can sort of uh, benefit from uh, a system that uh, allows for their, you know, ideological um, utopias to ultimately come out from, like, that's what I'm talking about. It's, it's a system that actually allows for those possibilities where today's system will fail to allow for them. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm certainly not making the claim that anarcho-capitalism is unique with its allowance of coercion. I mean, you know, obviously prior to this, I thought, if anything, it was unique in not allowing it, but obviously if it does allow... So, so it allowing coercion doesn't make it any worse than our current system, but it also suggests that it might not be much better. 
that's that's my problem it's like i'm not so i mean I, I fully take the point that what we have now is coercive so any kind of criticism i can throw at this incarnation of anarcho-capitalism is equally true of the system we currently live in i'm not comparing it to what we have so much as i'm comparing it to obviously what i'm proposing and what we want my problem is is like we already have this coercive system and to move to another coercive system or at least a system that could potentially be coercive doesn't seem a particularly strong selling point particularly for all of us who want to escape the coercion whereas leaving a coercive system and aiming for voluntarism as our means which might take us to an, a, a voluntary society that runs anarcho-capitalist and probably will to be honest because as you say it is what lends itself most to uh, you know like default for, for anarchism um, but it could also lend itself to some kind of other society that wouldn't really meet the criteria of anarcho-capitalism but would meet the criteria of voluntarism because the necessary rights are being respected okay well i'm going to kind of go back to like economics in uh and bringing up kind of some, maybe some of the same points that david friedman made i don't know but um like I think that your system in um, bringing about like voluntarism as the law or, you know, talking about voluntarist society instead of uh, ANCAP society, like it's still fundamentally ANCAP society. The economics don't go away based on what your ideology uh once those you know wants the rules to be so when you're saying that you know we're not going to tolerate x y and z like in a practical sense you are still going to tolerate that because it can still happen because um not everyone is going to go along with this law or whatever um, yeah but it won't be legitimized you know, like it say, won't be legitimized by you but it might be legitimized by someone else well not by the society that you're you're running though my my, my point is is but you're not like, running a society well all right not running a society but what i'm saying is the society like you're saying if we had our voluntary society we could still have these things occur if we have these anarchist societies we could still have these things occur. like I, I fully take that point. I'm not disputing it. Whatever society we have, things could occur that are a complete contradiction to that society that aren't mm -hmm. that aren't allowed. Just because they're not allowed doesn't mean that's a magic spell that prevents them from happening. You know, rape's not allowed; it still occurs. You know, my point is is it won't be allowed. So it might still occur, but it won't be viewed as legitimate by the ideology. You know, what, what my problem is, is the incarnation of anarcho-capitalism where drug laws are legitimate. Not that they occur, you know, like I say, rape might occur, but it's not legitimate. It's not a legitimate part of anarcho-capitalism. My point is, is that drug laws shouldn't be either. You know, anything that qualifies as kind of ruling people shouldn't be viewed as legitimate part of anarcho-capitalism because it contradicts at least one part of what anarcho-capitalism is i.e. the anarcho part. I mean, some people might argue it conflicts with the capitalism part because of capitalism being built on property rights, which is obviously connected to the non-aggression principle and self-ownership with regards to its roots. But then you are getting more into the moral thing. But with the anarcho part, and this might come down to our difference with regards to how we define rulers, but with the anarcho part, that's where I'm saying, well, you can't have that because it's that's a vile you know like if we had a communist dictatorship you can't have a privately owned factory now you might have one secretly you might you you know the, they might but they won't allow it it might happen without their allowing without their legitimizing it but that's in violation of what a communist dictatorship is and i'm saying likewise these coercive things should be deemed a violation of what anarcho-capitalism is just as private ownership would be considered a violation of what communist dictatorship is does that make sense but it's not because the communist dictatorship 
um, believes it's you know not allowed according to their laws. It's more to do with the fact that the communist dictatorship has uh, actual power via its monopoly, via its use of weapons, via its you know coercion. So, like, it's a lot harder to have a private company in a communist system, even secretly. Of course, they have secret police too, right? So there's a lot of physical, tangible things that prevent violations of laws, so to speak, in some kind of coercive dictatorship where you would not have those things by necessity in a voluntarist society. I understand what you're saying, but that's more to do with the policing than the standard. I mean, it's like, yeah, it, it seems to me that a communist dictatorship is going to find it uh, more easier and more in line with what it's already doing to enforce these aspects of it. Whereas because an anarcho-capitalist system is more freer by nature, there's more chance of these other things happening because people aren't paying attention and, and on each other's case so much. Fair point, take that point, don't disagree with it, but it doesn't change my fundamental point that it's still about whether it's allowed or not. Like, and I don't mean allowed as in like it, it, it was able to happen. You know, like, like I say, you know, rapes happen, not because we allow, I mean, we allow them in the sense that they happen because we don't stop them because we can't, but we don't actually allow them, allow them, you know. And what I'm saying is, is in a communist dictatorship, private ownership, wouldn't be allowed whether it's well policed or not is an is kind of a separate issue as to whether it's allowed or not as to how well they police what is and isn't allowed but what i'm saying is, is let's say they didn't i mean let's say it wasn't a communist dictatorship and let's just say communism without the dictatorship part so we haven't got the implied heavy level of policing but what we're saying is is if we had an anarcho-capitalist society where everyone's got private ownership over means of production and we're all trading and all of that that wouldn't be a communist society. We couldn't call it a communist society. And if we were calling our society a communist society, then all of those things happening would be viewed as illegitimate because they're not part of what makes up a communist society. Now, take exactly what I'm saying and then flip it round to what I'm talking about with the anarcho-capitalism thing. I'm not talking about how well we police it. I'm not talking about any of that aspect. I'm just talking about whether it's viewed as a legitimate part of what anarcho-capitalism is. So, yeah, I can, I can, I'm, I'm, you know, because someone might say to me, well, in a free society, there might be, because you're not being so oppressive, there might be more rape, there might be more murder. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. That's a separate conversation. But it's not part of what anarcho-capitalism is. Murdering people isn't part of what makes anarcho-capitalism anarcho-capitalism. And if murder was legitimate, it wouldn't be, you know what I mean? It wouldn't be in the, you know what I mean? So my, and, and the reason why I use the communist thing, and I forget dictatorship, because as you say, in, when we deal into the real world, there's a heavier level of policing. So it's less likely you'd get away with it. But the fact of the matter is, is whether or not you can get away with it is irrelevant. Let's say you lived in quite a, a loosely policed communist society that isn't a dictatorship. It's like an ANCOM or whatever. It's still communist because no one's allowed, you know, it's communist because it's supposed to be um, collective ownership and all the rest of it. You're not supposed to have private ownership. You're not supposed to have these hierarchies and all these things that make up the definition. If you do have those things, that just means this communist society is not policing itself very well or whatever, or if it's become societally accepted, then it's not a communist society anymore. Just like when we have slavery abolished, then we don't live in a slave society anymore. But it might still happen in little pockets without us knowing, or it might not be well policed or whatever. It's about the definition of what these things are. The definition of communism is not having private ownership over the means of production, running on profit, business models, employment, and all the rest of it. If you have that recognized by society as legitimate, then you can't really call it communist. If you have the opposite, if you have communes everywhere and no one owning any private property and all the rest of it then it would be hard to call that capitalist now i'm not so much focused on the communist capitalist thing my real stickler is the anarcho part and this whole ruling business because i'm just saying yeah maybe people could get away with 
stop it. Maybe I could get away with stopping my neighbour from smoking weed, but it wouldn't be a legitimate activity in anarcho-capitalism. It wouldn't be recognised as I have the right to enforce it as law, you know? Um, yeah, uh, that's probably the best way I can kind of explain it. Okay, but what what would David Friedman say when he goes in as an economist to look at your voluntarist society? What like what would be the kind of economic analysis of that? And I think it would be you know. I think there's some like definite merit to like your nations of sanity stuff um, that might make it a little more, um, uh, you know, prone to voluntarism than just kind of the naked and Kapistan stuff. But I think fundamentally on, on just the economic part, when we, stop talking about like whatever um these kind of abstract philosophical notions when we look tangibly at it what is the economic analysis what are the incentives i think you end up with exactly the same incentives that there were in what we were talking about with anarcho-capitalism it's just when the someone starts collecting slaves and they start, um, uh, you know, um, not letting them leave. They start, uh, you know, there's like a legal order that develops around that that says, okay, slavery is now allowed. You just say that that's no longer voluntarism. It does not make it less likely for that to occur. It just means that when it does occur, you're defining it away from the system that you're talking about. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I don't disagree with that point. And I mean, when they, when when David Freeman talks about, well, what's it going to look like? And if he wants to put, I mean, I, I can't speak for him and what he would say. But if he was to say, well, your society would probably just be anarcho-capitalist, I wouldn't disagree with that. And I wouldn't disagree with all the incentives he and you have laid out with regards to promoting the virtues of anarcho-capitalism. My point is, is those virtues are dependent on the voluntarist aspect. If you add coercion into the mix as part of the definition of what you're talking about, then a lot of what you're talking about becomes less true. You know? It's not, it's not in the definition though. It's just in the realm of possibility. For sure, but yeah, I mean, like I say, I'm not, I'm not disputing that necessarily. But my point is, is what's in the realm of possibility to occur? Is could, is anything, including something that's the polar opposite to what you're talking about? You know, like you know, like I said, it's in the realms of possibility that anarcho-capitalism could descend into a communist dictatorship. That's in the realm of possibility. But my point is, is if it did that it wouldn't be anarcho-capitalism anymore. Now, I understand fully that that's not some magic spell that protects it from ever becoming that, just because I say, oh, well, then it's not anarcho-capitalism anymore. I understand that. I'm not saying that some, you know, like, you know, it's all very well me saying, well, this isn't voluntarism anymore. I'm going home. <laughs> it's not preventing whatever happened from happening. So, yeah, I, I take that point. I'm not disputing that. But my point is, is... By having, by having the definition of, of your ideology encompass and include those violations so that you, those things can happen and you wouldn't even say it's no longer anarcho-capitalism, then all of a sudden we're all getting on a train that could be taking us to a free society that could also be taking us to Auschwitz, you know? And the train could go to either place. It might be less likely to take us to Auschwitz, but it could take us there. That train, it's not about us. And I'm saying, okay, the voluntarism train is only taking us to free societies. Now, that train might, train might get derailed 
we might get kidnapped and put on a totally different train taking us somewhere else but then it would be what i'm saying is is that was that that is what would be required you would have to actually remove the you'd actually have to change the voluntary society from the voluntary society to have for these coercion to come in whereas in the anarcho-capitalist society it can happen as a sleight of hand because we have this society called anarcho-capitalism and it might look like a free society at one point but but without ever without anyone ever raising alarm because it never changed the definition. It's not, no one ever said, hang on a minute, this isn't anarcho-capitalist anymore. He's doing something that's not in line with it. If we say, well, no, no, that is in line and that is in line and this is in line and all these coercive horrors are still in line with our ideology. You know, like I said, I realize it's not a magic spell by saying, oh, now it's no longer that ideology. But the, the problem is, is I do think the opposite is somewhat true in regards to the fact, well, if we allow these things as part of the ideology, then even before, you know, like, you know, what I'm saying is, is to have a coercive society from a voluntary society, you're going to have to dismantle voluntarism and replace it with something different. But to have coercion in a cap in an anarcho capitalist society, you don't. It can still be an anarcho capitalist society, and it could just drift into some kind of coercive nightmare and still be anarcho capitalism. And that's my problem. I can't get behind something that could involve slavery, could involve could involve drug laws, could involve a lot of the same coercion. That's the entire reason why I object to government, and the reason why I feel like I'm casting a bigger net. Not necessarily with, when we're talking about these circles, that's why I wanted to know what you were talking about with the circles, because when, whether we're talking about what it's encompassing or whether we're talking about the, the wide net you're casting with regards to the potential people that would be keen to be involved and support such a system, I just think, certainly from my own experience of speaking to people, if I want to try and convert people into capitalists, I'm only really going to have luck, for the most part, with people who are already capitalists. You know, but I can convert statists to voluntarists or people that maybe aren't active statists, but they're not active voluntarists because they just not had the conversation in their head. You know, like I say, I'm speaking to people that have voted for Bernie Sanders. You know, they're 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 they're, they're proud socialists or they're proud um, progressives. But even though me and you might, or even though many people would say, well, socialism is the opposite to voluntarism. You can't have the two. Well. Only because your definition of voluntarism includes the government coercion, their definition of sorry, your sorry, your your definition of socialism, sorry, includes the government coercion. Their definition of socialism doesn't, so they can pursue voluntarism and still call themselves a socialist. They can pursue pursue voluntarism. I mean, basically, what the way I kind of pitched it to the progressive voluntarists I spoke to is, I said, look, voluntarism is synergistic with all ideologies. So you could be a conservative voluntarist. You could be a liberal voluntarist. You could be a voluntary socialist. You could be an anarcho-capitalist. You could be all of these things and still be a voluntarist. The only thing you couldn't be that's truly, truly, truly oxymoronic that you couldn't be a voluntarist is a fascist voluntarist, because that truly is a complete contradiction. But all the other kind of isms could synergize with voluntarism because you just remove the coercive aspect and keep the other fundamental parts so for example you could have a commune that has all the trappings of a commune but no violation of self-ownership no violation of property rights people are still free to not be in the commune and, and pursue other economies and all the rest of it but it just so happens that enough people voluntarily choose to be part of a commune then you'd have a society that most people would agree isn't anarcho-capitalism, but is voluntarism. Same with the progressive guy I was talking to and had lots of ideas, as do I, about various forms, that, various ways that voluntary collectives can exist, you know, as alternatives to the standard business models. And again, without the coercion, all of these things can function as a form of voluntarism. Whereas, like I say, the only thing that can't is fascism, because fascism is explicitly the opposite to voluntarism. Everything else, can be a form of voluntarism. Whereas if you're doing it under the anarcho-capitalism flag, not only are you casting a less wider net, because you're only really going to get enthusiasm from right-wingers, left-wingers aren't going to have anything to do with you, but also not only are you going to have a smaller number of people potentially on your train, but your train might go to some very bad places as well. 
so it's like so for me those are the kind of two fundamental aspects that the um that i have the problem with is i think one i think that voluntarism actually casts a bit has wider appeal because people don't have to betray their economic values necessarily some might you know like it depends what they are i mean i've spoken to co plenty of people on the left who are dedicated to the coercion that's part of their ideology you know the commies that want to steal your means of production and all the rest of it so there's you know there's plenty of people that you're not going to convert to volunteers but i've also spoken to plenty of people that are open to that and are accepting of that but don't want to call themselves capitalists don't want to trust everything to the free market they still want to pursue social programs they still want to pursue collectivism they just understand that self-ownership has to be respected along the way whereas getting those same people it's like i said before trying to convert socialists into capitalists is a fool's errand for the most part you might have a little bit of success here and there but for the most part you won't have success but if i take the socialists and the capitalists who are currently in the status paradigm and say come down to the voluntarism line you don't have to move along the left right axis just come down to the what we call the bottom line of um you know on that political compass come down to there and they're much more um because the, the one of the reasons why they're much more obliging is because in their mind they're not even changing anything i mean like the progressive i spoke to at no point did he say well i've actually changed my values it's really he's just come to the realization that his current values are better served and more consistent if he embraces voluntarism because many of the values he has about oh we should you know people should be treated this way and people should be treated that way that lead him to like you know his kind of socialist leanings are based on this on the same self-ownership that he's not consistent with it's the same with people on the right wing it's about saying look you both have these values they're actually based on a moral, a moral principle that moral principle is self-ownership and both the left and the right are kind of being selective with their application of that principle and i'm saying well let's all get on that same page of the principle separate us from the hypocrites so right wingers should shun authoritarian right wingers and only be with people that are vol fellow voluntarists and the left wingers should do the same shun the authoritarian versions and actually be more allied with right wingers who share their voluntarist aspects sorry i went on a bit there but that's kind of my whole spiel about why i feel that even though i understand where you and david are coming from by saying look an anarcho-capitalism is the means to get us to the ends of a free society I'm saying the problem is, is that means if it's a, if you allow coercion is corrupted, whereas it might get us to a free society, it might as get us to a lot of other places. And I think it's a harder sell when you have to admit that. Whereas if you say, well, let's all go for a free society and maybe that society will be socialist, maybe it will be capitalist, but either way, it will be a free society. And the other thing as well is the people that say, oh, well, it will probably be a capitalist society. Well, that's only because that's what people would freely choose if they live in a free society you know whatever the, the beauty of it is whatever exists in a free society will be there based on merit so the socialists who want to say that socialism works better will have to put their money where their mouth is because they won't be able to force anyone into their systems and if they do have things working in a free society they'll be there based on merit and vice versa with the capitalists sorry i went on loads there <laughs> okay well it's I don't know. I still think it's um, it's what I'm talking about. And, you know, again, we can call it just anarcho-capitalism, market anarchism, or just anarchism in the broadest possible sense. Like that's that to me seems like much more synergistic thing. The nap and voluntarism, it's like it is a very particular kind of morality it seems like and you know i think kind of the same thing working against capitalism as like an ugly term for a lot of people a turn off like voluntarism has the kind of opposite effect where like oh i have this certain understanding of what voluntary means and i like it you know but it might not be the same um the concept of voluntary that Rothbard means when he says um, voluntarism. So, well, that is why 
I mean, I, yeah, I take that point. And that is why I do think this whole idea of establishing a universal standard of the NAP as law through a peace agreement, you know, the whole nation society thing, that is why I think that is important because I do think you need, even if it's just creating a lower resolution version of the NAP that could be internet, you know, universally applied, mm -hmm. I think you do need that because there are fuzzy edges, there are areas where there's that's open to interpretation and i think we can't enforce the gray but we need to draw a line so that the gray areas don't infect the black and white and people can't stretch the interpretations into absurdity you know to use my desert versus grassland thing we need to be able to say okay this area in between is hard to define where it's a little bit deserty and a little bit grasslandy okay we won't enforce that but here where there's only sand we're in the desert and we have to have an international standard where we say this is definitively the desert well I, like i mean one thing that david said to me was about well what about people that like you know have different religious beliefs or what about the person who thinks that you as an atheist are dooming the world and he has the right to kill you because it's actually the kind of thing to do or whatever kind of bullshit delusion he has and stuff like that and i'm like look whatever system we have whether it's mine yours or whatever all of them depend on us agreeing to some kind of extent on reality. All of them do. So there's no getting away from that. Whatever system we do, we all have to be able to come together at least to a certain extent. I'm not talking about every little preciseness, but on a basic low resolution way, we need to have a basic agreement of reality. So the idea that someone can have some delusion about some kind of higher dimension where they actually own this person or, or whatever, you know, that's, that's not really, because they could have all sorts of delusions that would discredit anything. If we can all come to a basic understanding that each individual person owns their own self, that's the only understanding we need. That's the only agreement that we need. We don't need to agree. The problem with the anarcho-capitalism thing is you've got to convince people that capitalism is the best way to go. Now, you might be able to do that with a lot of people. There's no. Oh, sorry. Well, I, this was the point about saying that this is the natural consequence of anarchy. It's any anarchy that should... I expect to produce anarcho-capitalism, and then I expect anarcho-capitalism to produce um voluntarism but the like i'm entirely fine with working with probably even people that you're not as willing to work with like the ancoms you know i think that like as i say they're they're lending themselves to a system where they are not that powerful within that system. And any system like that is one that's conducive towards a market coming about. So ANCOMs fit that world. Um, all the players that probably work within both our systems, like um, maybe Hoppians or like mutualists, um, it, everyone on that lower, uh, part of the political compass. Um, they're all pushing towards this one point and then they want to diverge away from that point. But I mean, even when they diverge away from that point, their world is only as real as people are willing to um, put up with it and to the extent that people actually believe in it. So to me, um, when we have a society that's in any way like that, that is immediately the society that I want to live in because that's a society, even if it's a crappy society that I get to be like, oh, let me form my own society somewhere else and guess what they want to stop me but they cannot and that's that's where the elimination of government why why, what's that why can they not sorry the, the last bit they want to stop you but they cannot why is that right because they don't have the kind of um monopoly on force that a government institution has 
But do they need an absolute monopoly on force to stop you, though? Well, they, they can um, try to stop me by just having hordes and hordes and hordes of people who are also in agreement with their worldview. But um, you know, well, one thing is that uh, you know communism fails, and that that they're not going to have a great economy. And the moment that I do something a little more capitalistic is the moment that I have some kind of uh, superior, you know, s strength in some sense, maybe technologically, maybe um, in in the structure of my organization or something. But um, the other ingredient is that um, an anarcho-communist society is one where they first get rid of government, then they say, okay, here's what we want the rules to be. And then they say, okay, now, we have to like convert people to that set of rules. And that's a, like it's, it doesn't instantaneously become the case that everyone wants to live by those rules. They have to um, convince them every step of the way. But how are you, but the thing is though, I understand what you're saying, but the, I, I, the flaw I think in, that you make, or sorry, the, 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 the mistake I think you're making is like you're talking about, oh, well, you're not necessarily going to be able to convince them for this, but that's coming after you've already got rid of government. Now, my point is, is you're going to need some kind of support to get rid of government. Otherwise, how else are you going to get rid of government? Like, my point is, is like to, 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 to create the anarchist situation, we obviously need enough people to say right well, we want to get rid of government you know what i mean like this is the thing this is the point i probably didn't make very well but tried to make when i spoke with david because he was kind of saying well like you know how are you going to get people to go along with this it's like well how are you going to get people to go along with anarcho-capitalism how are you going to get people to say let's get rid of the government you know what i'm saying is is at the very beginning of this no matter what order you do things in at the very beginning even if you're starting off with just the loosest definition of anarchism, which is just getting rid of the government we've got now, nothing more than that. Just even to do that, you're probably going to need about as much support and about as much consensus and people thinking along the same lines as you, as you would to create where you want to go. You know, like, and to be honest, if you don't have the destination as part of the idea, if I said to people, hey, let's just get rid of government, and had nothing else to say about what we do afterwards, I'm gonna make a much weaker argument than if I say, let's get rid of government by establishing the non-aggression principle as law through a peace agreement, which would almost by default create a free, you know what I mean? What I'm saying is like, I, cause I understand the point of, you know, let's me saying this is, wouldn't it be great if we had this society sounds very la di da and utopian. But my point is, is, to get rid of government in the first place, you're going to need to convince people that it's a good idea to get rid of government. And if you can convince that and that many people to get rid of government in the first place, then why is it that much harder? If anything, I'd actually think it's easier to sell them the let's get rid of government idea if you've got a plan for what you're going to do after you get rid of government, rather than saying, hey, let's get rid of government and we'll probably end up over here if we let things run its course. Do you know what I'm saying? Well, the plan afterwards is made by each individual faction, and they're each going to um, go off and form their own little societies somewhere. And it's like there's not um, anything I can do to stop them. There's not anything they can do to stop me. But it's like, my goals are still met, their goals are still met, other people's goals are still met. Um, so everyone is still on the same page. Yeah, but that's, that's kind of my point though, because what I'm saying is, is you've got these little different factions that might well want to go off and create different types of societies, but to get rid of government in the first place, I'm assuming that all of these factions were united in the idea of getting rid of government. So you can then go off and do your own little thing, yeah? 
Uh So what I'm saying is, is if you can unite that many people to say, let's get rid of government and do our own little things. For me, I don't see why it's any more difficult. In fact, I would argue it's easier to say to them, hey, that same group of people, hey, let's all get rid of government and do our own little things under the understanding that none of us are going to fuck with anyone else. You know what I mean? Whereas I think that makes it a bet. I think I think that makes it an easier sell to them, because if I go up to a lot of people and say, let's get rid of government, that will scare the hell out of them especially if I've got no follow on from, you know, any kind of stipulation. If I say, hey, let's get rid of government and we'll all just do our own thing, which may include me coercing and oppressing you just the same as government did. But it also might mean that we do something different, you know. But if I say, let's all get rid of government under this agreement, I I suppose the point I'm making is, is however unrealistic people might think it is that I can convince enough people to establish the non-aggression principle as law through this peace agreement, I don't see it being any more realistic that you could get the equivalent amount of people to say, hey, let's just get rid of government and have no more conversation on what we do afterwards. Just let's just get rid of government. I, you but they're, they're, they're having those conversations separately. They're all, they're all planning on their own um, ultimate destiny. And they only come to this coalition just because it's like the thing they all mutually want. It's not the end all be all plan. It's but what I'm saying is, is I know what you're saying, but what I'm saying is, is the, what they all want is to get rid of government. You're saying I'm mm-hmm. saying, and I'm saying, well, what they all want is to get rid of government and have a free society where they're truly free to pursue, you know, whatever. But not all of them want that. There's anarcho-communists. They don't want that. Well, well, the thing is, is I would argue that the group of people, I mean, and this may be where we fundamentally disagree, but this is just kind of like my opinion on it. But I think that the, the group of people that just want to get rid of government, that's it, with nothing more said on the matter, is a smaller group than the group of people that want to get rid of government and replace it with a framework for a free society. Yeah, that seems kind of, um, I don't know, contradicted by its own definition, right? Because people, because that's clearly two things. Whereas my my suggestion is that it's so you're saying one that, one thing within those two things. So so you're saying that yours is easier to convince them because it's less things to convince them of. Is that what you're saying? Essentially, yeah. Okay, I take that, but I would disagree with that because I, because how convincing something, I know what you're saying, I'm convincing them of two things and you're only convincing them of one, but I'm saying that those two things make for a more convincing case than just the one. You know, like I'm saying, let's, let's put it this way, like let's say if I said, let's all leave this, let's all abandon this, say we're on a ship and it's on fire, right? And I can convince everybody to abandon this ship because it's on fire. Okay, fair enough. I'll convince a fair amount of people. But if all they think they're doing is jump, if they don't know anything more than that we're just abandoning ship, if I say, okay, let's all abandon ship and get on this other ship that's not on fire, that's two things. But I also think it's easier to convince them to do those two things than the one because those two things... The, the the two things involve abandoning a, a shipwreck ship and going to a better place rather than just abandoning a shipwreck ship without any you, do you know what i'm saying i know what you're saying about oh it's easier to convince people of one thing than it is two i can understand the logic in saying that as a general statement but my point is is the two things that i'm by adding the second thing you might think, oh, well, that's making it a harder sell because it's an extra thing. But I'm saying, yeah, but that extra thing may alleviate a lot of potential fears from the other thing. Because a lot of worries that people would have about getting rid of government would be somewhat alleviated by the idea of what you're replacing it with. Because I bet you, and I'm sure a lot of anarchists can attest to this, when you speak to people about the idea of getting rid of government, one of the first things they say is, and replace it with what? You know what I mean? That's the one, that's the thing that people are concerned about. So if you only say to people, let's get rid of government, I think that's a harder sell than saying, let's get rid of government and replace it with this, because you're offering them the answer to that question that might make them worried about getting rid of government. 
But there's many answers to that question of what do you replace it with? And okay, and like <laughs> voluntarism is kind of a somewhat narrow subset of those answers. And um, there's a large amount of other anarchists already and people with their own philosophical conventions that have come to something that is, you know, almost totally contradictory to voluntarism. And those people are frankly like probably make up uh, more of the anarchist population than the po anarchist population that is also voluntarist. I hope that's not the case. I mean, <laughs> you may well be right. Um, I know what you're saying about it being narrow in that sense. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's too narrow. I think it's as narrow, you know, it's, it's, it's rightly narrow because I think that's where we should draw the lines. I mean, that's where I want my lines drawn. People that don't like, like any system, any system that is actually in violation of voluntarism is a dangerous system to me. So I don't want to ally with those people. I don't want to work with them. I don't want to help them in any way. And this is my concern about getting on board this anarcho-capitalism train that includes people that want to take it to coercive places. I don't want to ally with those people. I want to ally with only people. And that's why I say I don't care how far left they are or how far right they are if they're on that bottom line of the political compass. But what I'm saying is, is, if you if we're just dealing on the capitalist side then you're on the right side i mean i think you know the political compass i'm talking about don't you like the left yeah. and the right and the up and the down so you've got so you've got the four quadrants you've got the top left authoritarian left top right authoritarian right and then bottom left is obviously voluntarist left supposedly and and bottom right is is voluntarist right anarcho-capitalism and stuff my point is is i'd rather have a coalition between the two bottom boxes than the right boxes I don't want anything to do with anyone on the top half, whether they're left or right. I don't want to work with fascists. I don't want to work with slavers. I don't want to work with rapists and murderers and thieves. Those are precisely the people that I think we need to draw a line down and say, you're our enemies. I would use force. I, I, in fact, I would feel I'm justified in using force to prevent their ideologies. I have, whether I, I mean, the thing is, is when I talk to ANCAPs about, voluntary socialism and stuff like that they'll laugh Pfft, yeah that's crazy but none of them are gonna want to take out a gun and prevent someone from forming a voluntary commune because it's no danger to them they might think it's laughable it's not going to work whatever it's not affecting them but the problem is is any kind of society where it's outside of the voluntarism realms is a danger to all of the societies that are inside the voluntarism realm so I will happily be more narrow with voluntarism. I mean, I don't think it is more narrow because I think you cast a wider net because, yeah, there are a lot of people that want to pursue non-voluntary systems, but they don't want other people to pursue non-voluntary systems that are different from theirs. You know, voluntarists can tolerate other voluntarists, but authoritarians cannot tolerate other authoritarians because they're different authoritarians to them. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, um, an earlier point you made that was that you could be any kind of voluntarist except for a fascist voluntarist, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm struggling to see that. I'm struggling to see how like just any, um, any other kind of utilitarian ideology would even fit within voluntarism if they think that the ends justify the means you have an example of one like, like which one do you have a problem with like for example i think you could be a conservative voluntarist do you would you say okay. that okay is that possible is that a yeah well that would be a narrow subset of conservatives oh yeah I'm, i mean I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm not saying that all conservatives are voluntarists far right. from it most of them aren't but what i'm saying is is there's nothing there's nothing inherent in the definition of conservatism that says it has to be an authoritarian version it could mm -hmm. be there could be a voluntarist version and my point is is that's true of every ism 
except for fascism, because fascism is explicitly non-voluntarist. All the other ones often are non-voluntarist in how they incarnate, like communism is a good example. Communism almost always only exists in an authoritarian form. But there's nothing inherent to the definition that precludes it from existing in a voluntary means. Volunt you know, if you, like I say, if you had voluntary communes where that were truly voluntary and non-coercive, that's voluntarism. And it would still be classed as some kind of communism. Like I say, what I'm saying is, is you can have a society, like a voluntary collective, that runs in lines with conservative values, but because it respects self-ownership, it's voluntarist. Then you could have a society that runs in lines with liberal values, but because it's voluntarist, but, sorry, because it accepts self-ownership, it's voluntarist. And I'm saying that that's true of every ism I can think of, apart from fascism, because obviously fascism is, exp that, it, it, with fascism, the definition is, that it's not voluntarist. But all of the other ones, although most of them are, you know, like I say, most conservatives aren't voluntarist, most liberals aren't voluntarist, most certainly most commies and socialists aren't voluntarist, and even probably most people that call themselves capitalists aren't voluntarist. But what I'm saying is, is all of those people could be and still be capitalist, conservatives, liberals, progressives, whatever, whatever label they have, they can add voluntarism to that and be a voluntarist version. Or they could be an authoritarian version. And I'm trying well, to convince it to be the voluntarist version of what they already are. I don't know. All those seem, uh, they seem like um, kind of political sorts of ideologies or sort of cultural ideologies or something. But how about like a different moral ideology? Like I think um, utilitarianism would be something that would contradict um, the NAP because it by its nature does not care about moralistic arguments. It cares about the ends and whatever gives them those ends, right? Yeah, but they, you could say, in fact, I know people that who are voluntarist for the utilitarian reasons. You know, they say, I think a voluntary society would work best. And I think being a voluntarist is the best way, even though I don't actually believe morality exists. Do you know what I mean? So I, I don't think that, even utilitarianism, I don't think actually, it doesn't conflict with it in that way. I know, I know what you're saying, because it's not using, voluntarism is invoking morality and utilitarianism is specifically ignoring morality. Mm -hmm. But... but my point is, is it could still choose voluntarism for utilitarian reasons, um, even if it's not embracing the moral principles, you know? But I, it's like, it's not the same as saying that, you know, any utilitarian could become a voluntarist, you know? It's like, it, it is a very specific uh, thought process I mean, I, I do see what you're saying, because they are the one, they would be one of the groups. I mean, let's put it this way. If I had all of these different types of voluntarists, and I knew which were which, the conservative voluntarists and the liberal voluntarists, the utilitarian voluntarists would be the ones that I would keep an eye on, because I know that they don't have any moral dedication. They're only in it as long as it's their benefit to be in it. And if all of a sudden authoritarianism seem to be the better way to go they would quite happily abandon voluntarism so i get what you're saying in that regards but there's nothing explicit in utilitarianism that prevents them from being voluntarist in the way that is true with fascism like like you can't be a fascist voluntarist because the definitions are literally op explicitly opposite you know okay. whereas you could be a utilitarian voluntarist even though you don't actually have any moral dedication to voluntarist, you just, you are it for utilitarian reasons, if that makes sense. Could you be an authoritarian in all these different systems as well, except, except for voluntarism? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, you know, I don't think that's... Uh... And that, sorry to interrupt, but that's, yeah. that comes to my point about the wider net, because I'm talking about, you've got all these different factions, I have the potential, with the exception of the fascist, to reach all of them. Now, I'm not going to reach all of all of them, because, you know, many of them are going to be authoritarian or the rest of it, but that none of those ideologies are precluded from being voluntarist, as I say, apart from fascism. So, in that sense, there is a potential for a wider net to be cast, whereas 
you know, if you go for, if you're just doing like the ANCAP thing, you're only going to get cappies and, and people that are of that, maybe objectivists, maybe conservatives, because, you know, but people on that right side of the spectrum, you're not going to get progressives, you're not going to get socialists, you're not going to get, you know, communists and all of that, whereas you okay. might get those people through the voluntarism thing. Yeah, but I got to get, go back to this point where I think that's a primarily semantic thing. I think the thing that we're really talking about is, um, something that is, you know, not even necessarily capitalist in the way that um, left-wing people like to portray capitalism as. So, you know, the, the place on the political spectrum where I see what I'm calling kind of market anarchism is a, <laughs> wide net that encompasses, you know, precisely the group of people that you're trying to talk about, you know, in the um, bottom half of the political compass. I don't think it, uh, I don't think it appeals to the top right of the political spectrum, exactly. I think it appeals to fundamentally um, people all across bottom, it should appeal to those people. The fact that it doesn't is just uh, the fact that they're, they have certain hangups about the term markets or the term capitalism. But more than that, see, it's not even like market anarchism that I want people to subscribe to. It's anarchism generally, and even like just the whole, if they're even on the libertarian half of the political compass, I think that's, um, that is enough in and of itself for me to say, I want to be those people's ally. And so I'm, I'm interested in like every single increment along the way, uh, not just like the, you know, final thing, um, you know, of a volunteer society. I do want that eventually, but it's like, I, when, when we're, let me put it this way. When you're trying to separate like the desert from the grassland, you can, um, you know, wait out for people to uh, agree that like this, area that specifically outlines like the Sahara Desert is the Sahara Desert. Or, you know, you could settle for something that outlines like all of like Africa and Europe, say. And then after that point, then you can say, okay, now here's within that, here's another circle and here's another circle and then you keep going down and you spiral into a better and better um, outline of where the Sahara Desert is, right? So that's why like, I'm into these incremental steps and, um, you know, anarcho-capitalism is along the way. I think this more general kind of anarchism of any variety is anywhere you know um that's that's that can be along the way too so it's like there's a lot of ways that um i find the the path to volunteerism ultimately can go through and um you know, any of those ways, even if the people's philosophical intentions are very, very different, what they're practically putting into practice is something that overlaps with the world that I want in a big way. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I understand where you're coming from and I, I, I see the points you make. I mean, the thing is, I suppose the fundamental issue is, is I think the net you're casting is too wide. And because of that, you're going to fail to catch many within. It's, it's like, it's, 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 I think the net, if the net's too wide, 
people won't want to be part of it because it's too wide. It's like it's like one of the reasons why I think the left and the right have such a hard time coming together is because the bad elements of both sides poison each other's view. I mean, it's a little bit like how you talked about how, you know, like people on the left have a very different definition of capitalism to what people on the right have. But the problem is, is you might have somebody who's very, you know, very free market principles, more of a kind of voluntarist anarcho-capitalist of what I'm talking about. But the problem is, is they'll have a hard time talking to some left winger because that left winger won't see them. He'll see the authoritarian right winger that he associates with them. And the problem is, is if we cast a nice big net that includes both authoritarian and non-authoritarian versions of both sides, I think either side will be more resistant to joining with, with them. You know, like, so you're going to have basically left-wingers who would be open to voluntarism and right-wingers who would be open to voluntarism are more likely to unite under voluntarism. Whereas if you cast a wider net that includes authoritarian versions of both sides, then each side's going to want nothing to do with it because the right-wingers aren't going to want anything to do with authoritarian commies and the left-wingers aren't going to want anything to do with fascists or you know whatever you want to call the right-wing authoritarians and so I, I do understand what you're saying about in a way it is casting a wider net but in a way it's too wide the net is too wide because it's bringing in so many elements that would push people you want on your train out because they won't want to be a part of it because there's Nazis on board. You know what I mean? It's like, like the potential coalition you could have because between people that are true, that are truly voluntarist deep down when you have the conversations, that potential unity is lost because they don't want to get on the same board that also includes Nazis and commies. Okay. Let me go back to um, Democrats, right? Or the Democrat democracy as a thing, right? Because, when um, back in like the 18th and 19th century, there were these people running around calling themselves Democrats and Republicans, and there were other people calling themselves monarchists and you know constitutional monarchists and all that. And um, <laughs> you know they were they were not like you know the Democrats and Republicans of today. They were their literal you know. Uh, they were the literal translation of their name. They were advocates for more democracy and more representational systems. And those people won, ultimately. They got more democratic systems. They got more representational systems. And it's, it's not because they had to convince everyone of their whole you know, worldview beyond just the democracy part or beyond the representational part, they had to convince people that their system that they were advocating for is the natural means to, you know, the um, other systems that were also popular at that time. So like the socialists, they got on board with the Democrats plan because they were like, oh, if we have more democracy, that means we can eventually have socialism. And the nationalists who hated the socialists, they were like, wait, if we got more democracy, then we can implement nationalism. And it became a coalition in that way. And so that's kind of, um, you know, the same thing I see you know, anarchy generally or anarcho-capitalism specifically, although I really don't see much difference ultimately, um, you know, either one of those by, by saying that I'm an ANCAP or an anarchist, that's just like saying that, you know, some, someone saying that they were a Democrat back in the 17 and 1800s, right? Yeah, and I've, so, well so there's, and one of the things is if you just look at like all the intellectual people, all the like philosophers of the past 300 years, almost 
every single one of them you can find on the lower half of the political compass, right? It, it, that's kind of interesting to me that in fact, like whenever people start thinking about this critically, they never end up on the upper half of the political compass and they always end up somewhere scattered about on the lower half. And so, and not all those people are voluntarists, you know, like Karl Marx is not really a voluntarist yet he kind of comes down there as wanting anarchy ultimately. I suppose that depends how we're classing the halves, I suppose. Um, <laughs> But yeah, yeah I, mean, I mean, I suppose if you're only classing voluntarism as literally the bottom line. See, that's not even where I, I consider voluntarism to be. I think voluntarism is more on the lower right. And I, it's kind of weird. I mean, ANCAP, they always put way in that corner there. Um, whereas the, the thing that me and David Friedman consider, you know, anarcho-capitalism or market anarchy, as I might uh, prefer it. Um, you know, it's, it doesn't really belong almost anywhere. It just encompasses like any number of possibilities. It's just a big blob somewhere in uh, that lower half of the compass. Why would voluntarism be bottom right? And if so, if that's where it is, what would be bottom left? Well, bottom left is more anarcho-communism, I would think. Anarcho cap or voluntarism is it does pay respect to property rights in a pretty significant way, I think. Yeah, but it also pays respect to self-ownership, which isn't a uniquely right-wing idea. I mean, I mean, I, I suppose, I mean, uh, to be honest, I'm, I, you're not alone in what you say, because a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people consider voluntarism to be basically anarcho-capitalism and synonyms and all that. So mm -hmm. they would probably put it bottom right for that reason. But assuming we're talking that, you know, that's not the case, I mean, I kind of view voluntarism as completely neutral because there's no economic preference at all. And the left right thing. But there is a moral preference. There's a very strong moral preference, right? But I don't see that as a left or right wing thing. I mean, I mean, I suppose, and, and maybe this is, maybe we're viewing this political compass differently, but I've always viewed the way the political compass works is you've got your left and your right, and you've got your up and your down. So mm -hmm. the left, the, the horizontal dimension is your economic preference and the up and down one is regarding freedom versus like you know so like like so like the very top line is most authoritarian least respect for rights and the bottom line is the most voluntarist and most respect for rights and then the left and the right thing is just about economic preference left being more collectivist right being more if you want individualist in regards to like, you know, like private ownership and stuff like that. So because of that, I mean, for me, ANCOMs aren't even on the bottom line because they're not voluntarists. For me, for me, voluntarist is just this neutral ideology of, like I say, the voluntarism aspect. I have anarcho-capitalism bottom right. I have anarcho-communism kind of, well, in, I actually have it in the top half, not at the top of the top half, but I have it in the, I, but then again, for me, the halfway line is representing the divide between authoritarianism um, and at least anarchism, if not outright voluntarism. I mean, I suppose outright voluntarism would be the bottom line, anarchism would be the bottom half. Um, so for me, and because I don't view ANCOMs as actually anarchists, um, I view them as kind of soft statists, um, I would put them in the top half. And not like I say, not at the top of the top half, that would be, you know, communist dictatorships or whatever and fascism on the right but um so maybe again maybe we're viewing the political compass slightly differently i do know a lot of people often kind of and i do reject this myself so i don't know if this is something that you're going along the lines of but i know some people kind of view anarchism as almost a right-wing thing or voluntarism as a right-wing thing so like the further you go left 
the more authoritarian you get and the further you go right, the more liberty you get. But for me, not only do I not agree with that, but that's certainly not what the political compass is doing, because the political compass is separating the authoritarian freedom thing and making it a vertical access. And then the left right thing becomes something totally separate. So for me, the vertical access on the political compass is the moral thing about freedom versus authoritarianism. And then the left and the right thing is just more to do with kind of economic way of life and perhaps morality with regards to values like conservatism on the right, liberal, liberalism on the left. But again, it's not so I suppose there is a moral dimension on the on the on the horizontal, but for me, voluntarism is a bottom. It, for me, it's a neutral ideology. Like anarcho-capitalism is the right-wing version of voluntarism, and the left-wing version of voluntarism, to be honest, doesn't really exist in any well-accepted way. Because, like I say, AMCOMs aren't voluntarists, and progressive voluntarists and voluntary socialists, who I've met one or two of, don't really. Well, maybe mutualists, up. right? Possibly. I don't know enough about what a mutualist is, but I have heard that term and syndicalist I've heard as well. I mean, I remember one person mm -hmm. who I introduced the Nations of Sanity Project to said, oh, that sounds like anarcho-syndicalism. So I was immediately Googling that and it sounded kind of similar, but not kind of quite. You know what I mean? It was like it, it, it felt like it was a few notches above voluntarism. It was a little bit etchy about private property still. From what I understood, I might have it wrong, but so so for me, I, but yeah. I always viewed voluntarism as just this completely neutral thing. Without, and I mean, that's kind of why I'm making this thing about you know you can be a voluntary communist, a voluntary socialist, a voluntary uh, conservative, uh, a voluntary cap, whatever. It's apart from fascist because, like I say, unless you're explicitly saying, you know, unless you unless you're actually in opposition to the non-aggression principle. I mean, this is the other thing about drawing that line I'm talking about, and this is why I'm so adamant. It might seem like, oh, I'm being too narrow with the net I'm casting, but I think there's value in that because I do think it means I'm more likely to get people in my net by being narrow enough that I'm going to get people on the left because they know that I'm excluding fascists and I'm going to get more people on the right who know I'm excluding authoritarian communists, whereas those people would not be part of what I'm offering if they knew that Nazis and authoritarian communists were included in the, in the uh, group, if you know what I'm saying. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's just that I think... <laughs> I don't think that um, I need to necessarily cast a wide net, although I, I kind of want to, um, you know, frame myself that way. I mean, I am also like more of a voluntarist ultimately. I do want that. Yeah. So it's like, if I'm talking to someone about anarcho-capitalism and then they get on, uh, their sort of peaked curiosity, I might also tell them about like voluntarist principles, but um, there's already people that want anarchy, that also want something else, that they're t going around and telling other people that, hey, let's do um, anarchy and this other thing. So they've got their two things. They've got their two elements. They're just, that second element is contradictory to your second element. But I'm arguing that it's also, in most cases, contradictory to their first element. And this is my whole thing about, although I'm all, on my, all about my voluntarism, this is why I did quibble with David Friedman about the whole definition of anarcho-capitalism, because I think that when you say they want anarchism, but they also want something else, without going into the details of what that something else is, I suspect what they want, that something else, is just something that proves that they never wanted anarchism. You know, like, like for example, if you say, well, they want something else like the right to enforce drug laws, for example, then I'm saying, well, then they don't want anarchism because anarchism can't allow for that because, I mean, again, this comes down to my definition of anarchism. Well, then maybe they're fools. Maybe it's like they're being foolish about it and they would really uh, benefit more from like a statist society. But the fact that they, 
um, are advocating for their thing, but secondarily to the fact that they're advocating for um, anarchy means that we'll get anarchy. And when we get anarchy, then we have market anarchy. And when we have market anarchy, then we can make our various decisions and go our separate ways. And that's, that's the point where we can start to talk about implementing a properly free society. Yeah, but if you've got a bunch of people who all think that they can have this other thing that is actually a contradicting violation of what it is they claim to be a part of, you know, like what I'm saying is, is I want to join. The reason why, I, like I say, this is why I've abandoned anarchism for voluntarism because I don't want the scenario you're laying out. I don't want um, and uh, people who think they're anarchists but aren't really on my train either. Like I, I don't want basically. For want of a better word, I know the word is misused a bit, but let's just call them fascists, whether they're left or right. Anyone who's not, let's let's be real, let me be real black and white and say we've got voluntarists and fascists. There's no in between now, Um, because that's the kind of dichotomy here, right? What I'm saying is, is I don't want any fascists on my side, even ones that don't realise they're fascists because they're that stupid. I want a coalition of actual voluntarists. That's what, I, that's what I'm trying to unite. And I'm trying to separate all of the people who would be, um, and the people who perhaps aren't sure, don't know what they are. I obviously want to convince them to be voluntarists and, and convince them that that's what they truly are. But if they're not, if what they truly are in their heart of hearts is a fascist and then what they really want is to violate people's rights, then I don't want to coalesce with them. Because the problem is, is while you might say, well, yeah, but they'll add to your numbers and help you get, you know, this anarchism. But the problem is, is even if that was true, which, like I say, I think it's countered by the fact that a lot of people be put off by their existence and all the rest of it. But even if that was true, that you'd get more people by doing having that wider net in that regard, for me, the net is compromise. You know, like, I'd rather have a narrow net full of voluntarists who all know that we're having voluntarism, and that's what we're aiming for. And that's what we've defined. And that's what we're going to that's where this train is heading you know we might get derailed or whatever but this is our destination and we all know where we're going i'd much rather have that than have this other train full of nazis and commies and all kinds of other um, authoritarian criminals who think we're going to have something else and if there's enough of them that might be what we end up having and we've rather than them assisting us on our journey to an anarchist society we've assisted them on a, their journey to a different type of coercive society. Okay, well, let me go back to um, democracy again, because, okay, after all the socialists and nationalists got together with the Democrats and the Republicans and they all converged on this um, system they each uh, considered would benefit their project democracy could you know it did some socialist things and some nationalist things along the way sure but the other thing it did was that it created um a lot of cronyism and a lot of um just corporatism and sometimes uh democracy creates the environment in which uh despotism comes about and that's not something that either the socialists nor the nationalists nor really any ideological elements really wanted to happen. That was just a byproduct of the nature of democracy itself. And I think there's like similar things in um, anarcho-capitalism or in anarchy uh, when you really dig down and look at it economically where the things that it is prone to collapsing into are not those despotic things. They are the kinds of institutions that David Friedman talks about. Um, but I actually, I actually think you're kind of arguing my case for me, obviously, <laughs> not, not, not intentionally so, but because- well, We don't have to tell the fascists that. that if they want to, if they are convinced that, that that anarchy will give them somehow a more fascist system, then 
you know, let them believe that, let them advocate for anarchy, let anarchy be established, and then let the economic forces take over. And it's those economic forces, not the ideological forces, that will give us whatever it will give us. But the problem is, is those economic forces will only take over without the coercion. Like my, my point is, is what you're truly removing to allow that to happen is what, and what was actually stopping it from happening in our current society is the coercion. So my point is, is if you don't remove that coercion, then you won't, then, then what you're saying loses its value because the, the, the only reason that's true, in my opinion, at least, I mean, feel free to obviously dispute this, but the only reason what you're saying is true is because of the coercion you're removing when you remove the government. Now, if you don't remove the coercion when you remove the government, then I don't think that is true. Like all of the all of the arguments that you can make, all of the free market arguments, all of the reasons why the free market is better than government is because you've got voluntary interactions where people can actually cooperate for their mutual benefit. Doesn't mean there's not exploitation, doesn't mean it's all perfect, but you know, generally speaking, it leans in that direction, as you say. But the reason for that is because of the voluntary nature of it. And the reason why the government systems are all working the opposite way and are, and are basically corrupt and, 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 for want of a better word, fucked, is because of the coercion. So my point is, is if we remove government without removing the coercion, it's just, it, you're not removing what's actually the problem, if you know what I'm saying. And the problem is, is you even gave the example yourself where not only do we have the problem that I mentioned of casting this wide net full of Nazis and commies who might end up corrupting your train and taking it to the place because there's you've recruited that many you know it's all very well having extra support and that and it's and they think they're supporting something else but if there's enough of them it will end up supporting something else but also the other problem is which you highlighted in the example you gave that in addition to the nefarious things that each side want there's also a lot of nefarious things that happen that neither side want because and again of the coercive nature the problem with democracy again the coercive nature it's the nature of it that's the that's the nature of it that's the problem that's why i think voluntarism strikes at the heart of the problem more so than anarcho-capitalism does because it's the coercion you remove all of the arguments for the free market and all of the reasons why the free market systems work better than the governments is because the governments don't have any incentive to provide you with what you need because they're dealing with stolen money. If, if you allow that same level of coercion into a capitalist system, you just undermine all of its qualities and virtues, I would argue. Well, I guess I don't think it's the coercion alone. I think it is... Um, coercion that is uh, kind of systematized and in a, a certain order that... Um, but it's also, isn't that, sorry to cut you, but isn't that yeah. also an inevitable result of the coercion? Because it's like, if you've got, say for example, if you've got people that allowed the coercion of enforcing drug laws, like David Friedman argues, well, that's not going to be something that would be um you know like in likely that you know it's going to be worth my while to enforce drug laws and all the rest of it well in a free society it certainly wouldn't be worth your while even if that particular activity as an isolated thing was allowed because of all the other stuff you can't do but if coercion is allowed into the game and you can have private pr prisons and crony court systems and all of a sudden i mean it's like i know the you know um ruling authorities governments states whatever you want to call them they, they've existed for as long as recorded history so we don't know how it all begun if you like but it's certainly conceivable that it just begun by a bunch of people who were trading and doing this all deciding that if they don't have to give a monkeys about people's rights then they can kind of just they don't have to obey these they don't have to provide value for money then all of these free market principles that that make the arguments you're making sound well a lot of them if not all of them go out the window when you allow coercion because it's the 
absence of coercion that allow those things to work. It's the fact that we have to trade that we can work for mutual benefit. If I can just coerce you, then I don't need to. It doesn't matter how many, like when David Freeman says, oh, well, they'll lose customers. Who cares about customers? No one's got a choice. You know what I mean? It's like, that's what the government does. That's why they provide us with such shitty service because none of us have a choice because they exert coercion. And all right, I do take your point that one centralized authority that's got monopoly can provide a more systemic um uh you know implementation of that but the fact of the matter is is even the dispersed one apart from the fact that there's a good chance that it will merge eventually into one anyway because you know interests are going to start joining pharmaceutical companies will join up with insurance companies as they do now you know you have these unholy coalitions if you have people that are going to then exert you know Oh, well, we can enforce drug laws. Oh, well, we'll have private prisons. Oh, well, we'll have a farm. I mean, it's like the free market. How can you have a free market if people can't f freely trade in drugs? That's a part of the market that you're completely compromising. What if you want to start up a cannabis-related business and someone else is just going to just basically stop you from doing that? They're doing the same thing to you that a government would be doing. It might not be so systematic as it would be with one centralised authority, but the... But the, con the and so, you know, you could perhaps still argue that it might be a few shades better than what we've got now. It might be, it might not. There's, there's other aspects that counter that where people say, well, at least under a government, we have some kind of illusion of say. It's not just, you know, a free for all and stuff like that. You know, so the problem is, is you're not, I, I don't think if you don't remove the coercion, you're not solving the problem of government. If you're only removing government under that narrow definition of a centralized authority with a monopoly and all the rest of it, but you're still allowing decentralized authorities and rulers and violations and coercion, then, like I say, so many of the things that make anarcho-capitalism worthwhile just disintegrate when you allow that rot to set in. And as I say, and then the other problem is, is even if you're going to aim for that, if you have too many people on board that are aiming for something else, they might end up steering you to that something else. And before you know it, instead of the fascists helping us create anarchism, the anarchists have helped the fascists create fascism. And history tells us the latter is more likely than the former. Uh-huh. I, I take your uh, point there. Um, that's kind of like... Uh... It reminds me of Animal Farm, you know, where the... In fact, I should have given that as an example, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, uh, I see that it's actually now 8.22 p.m. here. I don't know how ungodly late it's, what it is over there. What time did we start there. the conversation your time? Uh, like, I think like 4.15. <laughs> So this is like about four. To be honest, it was, I was starting to think, I think we've been talking for quite a while. Um, yeah. so perhaps we should wrap it up. I mean, it's been a really good conversation, though. And as I said, I didn't expect like to us to be changing minds or anything. But, you know, like I say, just understanding each other's points and stuff like that, which I think we do now. After, yeah, yeah. You know, sure. so, um, so that's been the value. If you ever want to do another conversation, I'm always, always happy to talk about these things. So. I would definitely be up for that. But yeah, we probably should wrap it up. Is there anything you wanted to sort of close off with? Uh, no, you know, I just think, you know, that, um, <clears throat> you know, I think that um, this lower half of the political compass is very interesting in that a lot of different ideologies that are very, very disparate always seem to end up down here. And the past 300 years of intellectual thought have been almost entirely down here on the lower half of the political compass. And the fact that, you know, anyone <laughs> resides today on the upper half is kind of ridiculous. Maybe most people don't. Maybe governments are the only things that really reside there. So I think there's a lot of reason to be generally optimistic um, that maybe we can get uh, a better world someday. So I think that's the point where I want to leave off on. And I think we can have um, an ample amount of alliances with people to get to the sorts of worlds that we want. Yeah, I, I, 
In fact, I think that's a perfect way to finish it because that is actually a positive note. And it almost filled me with a little bit of extra hope because you're right. I mean, if you think about it, most people do gravitate towards that kind of voluntarism end. I mean, I would still add that perhaps it furthers my point to say, let's take them all the way. Because if we do decide to draw a defining line that separates the voluntarists from the various forms of fascists or whatever you want to describe the other side of that, if we do draw that line, there's a good chance that we'll have the majority on our side when you actually, you know, set that line in sand in that way. Although I do take your point and understand where you're coming from about saying, well, look, we've got a big group of people close enough. Maybe we should just cast our net a bit wider and bring them in too. That's, and to be honest, I can see the merits of that argument. I would still stick by my own argument of saying all the more reason to just say, look, you're, you're close enough, just come a little bit further to be actual voluntarists. And I still think we could potentially have the, the majority if we had the conversations you know, with them. Because as I say, I know it's only anecdotal and speaking to one or two people here and there, but I've spoken to a lot of people that you know call themselves all sorts of different things on that left-right spectrum that are quite happy to move to the very bottom of the voluntarism versus fascism spectrum. So that's another reason, in addition to your point, that's another reason to have a bit of hope. So, um, so yeah, really positive message. Um, thank you for taking the time to have this conversation. Thank, thank you, you for having me. You're welcome. And uh, thank you anybody who's uh, listened to us for all of this. Uh, <laughs> uh, i hope it's been as enjoyable for anyone listening as it has been for me because i've like i said i've really enjoyed going through this so i really appreciate that all right